Hi, Misha here, and it's the big MIG video that I mentioned when we were doing the Fox Sound. We're going to cover them all from the 15 through the 31, and mostly all Hobby Master, with really one exception. And I'm going to give kind of a little general overview. This isn't going to be completely in depth. I've tried to edit things down as much as I can, but it's still going to be a very long video. If you could, please do like, share, and subscribe, because this was a lot of work. Also, this is not meant to be a political video, not modern politics anyway. This is just about enjoyment of studying history, looking at engineering, aviation, technology. I've made my opinions on the war in Ukraine apparent in black boxes, so this is in no way endorsing that. Heck, I'm not even a violent person. But I would say, too, keep in mind both Ukraine and Russia are flying a lot of the same aircraft. So, yeah. That said, though, nothing's ever black and white. There's never a good guy, bad guy. That's not how the real world and history works. I just wanted to plug that in because I know the times we live in, and I didn't want there to be any uh, mistakes of that. And I certainly didn't want to offend anyone on that side because it's a it's a hell of a thing more and unfortunately the politicians who order it aren't the ones who pay the price it's civilians and innocent civilians usually and that is tragic so wanted to make that clear that said though i do enjoy history and we can study history and enjoy learning about it and the technology and do our best just to kind of disconnect from the broader implications, including the old Cold War politics. Like I said, it's not black and white. Rarely, if ever in life, is there a strictly speaking good guy and bad guy. That said, I've always liked MiGs because when I was a kid, these were the bad guy jets. Yeah, I was the kid that liked Cobra G.I. Joes and stuff too, and Stormtroopers. <laughs> it's more fun that way. And when I was a kid, we didn't know a whole lot about MiGs. We knew the 15, the 21 stuff on the 23 and the 29, though. That was developing technology. In fact, I was several years old before the 29 even came out. So, yeah, we're going to take a deep dive into MiGs. And if this video does well, maybe we'll do other Russian aircraft, Suhoi. Helicopters, we'll see what comes next. And with that, let's go back to right after the end of the Second World War, aka the Great Patriotic War for the Soviet Union. All right, after a lot of prep, I really do hope you guys enjoy this video and do please like and share uh, because, yeah, I really enjoy doing them, but. Phew, this was basically an all-day project, getting everything together. Anyway, just wanted to mention that, if you could, please. Anywho, if we're going to talk about jets, we have to begin with the first generation. And for our Russian aircraft, that would be the MiG-15 and the MiG-17. Technically, these are late first-generation jet fighters. The first generation begins, of course, with World War II. The uh, the British Gloucester Meteor, the German Messerschmitt Me262, and even America coming in at the tail end with its P80, later F80. First gens were straight wing in the beginning, and Germany would actually start the swept wing idea, although they really didn't know. They kind of actually stumbled upon it. These aircraft would be subsonic of course some of them not much faster than a propeller honestly and they would be armed with either machine guns or cannon and radars would be very limited use only on the last of the first generation most of them were true fighters although some were designed to intercept bombers as well yeah very primitive aircraft at the time but uh a huge leap forward considering where aviation was in 1938 right before World War II began. As for Russia, while it did have some 
tests and prototypes of rocket and jet powered aircraft during the war in 1945 it was actually behind the curve and it realized it but they had a plan they had a bunch of not only captured German technology and aircraft but captured Germans and hey Russia's not gonna let them live there rent free right so we basically have intellectual labor camps set up and hmm, thus the Russian space program but we're talking about aviation about jets good times so the MiG-15 most of our aircraft today will be from Hobbymaster all will be diecast and all will be in 172 scale because that's what I collect yeah if you're getting into models and you think you might mix scales trust me unless you're a very special and talented person it will quickly bug you you'll kind of settle into one scale be it 148 172 or 144 or even a lot of people do 1 200 1 400 if they're doing like large commercial planes 172 is mine although for larger aircraft i will permit one 144 just thought i'd do that because people always ask me who made these and stuff and yeah most of them hobby master the majority actually came from pete's collectibles who i've been buying from for years now and uh, some also came from aikens which is closely located to me and as i said in the beginning i'm not going to show every single aircraft i've got that would be more work than i already have but i've tried to bring out at least a couple of each type for fun and we'll start here with a pretty standard mig 15 fighter trying to center you a bit it's not the easiest thing to do when you can't actually see so do my best so back to russia 1945 you have uh, what would evolve into two different air services the vvs which is more of a standard tactical air force and you have the pvo which is an air self-defense force basically to, to protect russia from uh, bombers because america had the b-29 america also had nuclear weapons 1945 russia did not what they did not also have was a production jet aircraft using german technology they would create several prototypes and in 1946 the uh, i-300 would first fly and it would be adopted into vvs service as the mig 9 in 1947 and they would build over 600 of these so not a tiny run but it was limited um it was only capable of about 550 miles per hour maybe a little more at a stretch so very much subsonic had a max altitude of a little over 40,000 feet, and it was armed with 37 millimeter cannon. It was also a straight wing design, as it happened, or at least enough that it didn't matter. They were hoping to do a MiG 9M updated version, but meanwhile, others convinced Stalin to uh, approach the the English, the UK. Their Meteor had had pretty good success it was one of the very first jets to go into full production along with the 262 and because the new labor government in britain the new more liberal government wanted to have better ties with russia the soviets post world war ii they agreed to sell them the british mean engine the rose royce yeah you can think what you want about that but this gave them a new kind of lease on life and so mig was ordered to take the British engine. They got several complete engines as well as Strong's and uh, make an aircraft for it. And thus at the tail end of 1947, the prototype of this, the MiG-15, although at that time it was still known as the I-310 test flew, it uh, had a British engine in it because they were still working on their version copy known as the RD-45. It took a little more time in 1948, it was selected over the competition, which is the LA-15, and that uh, would go into uh, service the next year. It would first be shown off during the May Day Parade to the world and to the West. And even though the prototype actually flew a couple of months after the F-86 Sabre in the U.S., it was really cranked out into production quicker. So you might argue it was in service earlier. And the, uh, the MiG... 
15 has the British engine and it has a swept wing about 35 degrees with about a 55 degree tail. It was pretty much an aluminium alloy frame, pretty simple, straightforward, which is what they wanted. And um, this is where they really discovered that, hey, sweeping the wings is a good idea. In fact, it was the first military production aircraft to go into well, full production with swept wings, quickly followed by the Sabre. Previous aircraft, like the F-84, had straight wings. The Germans had the idea with the, the ME262. It actually does have slightly swept wings, but they didn't know it. They didn't do it for performance. They actually did it for engine reasons. So the initial version, known as just the MiG-15, originally the U.S. Air Force type designated as the Type 14. Later, NATO would call this Fagot. And the first one would, would retroactively be known as the Fagot A after the Fagot B was introduced around 1950. And that's pretty much what we have here. Also known as the MiG-15 Biz for plus or upgraded. These first flew in 1949 as a prototype. In 1950, introduced with upgraded engines, better communications, better radio set, very important, better navigation system, improved control surfaces, and uh, just more access to things like uh, under wing tanks and such. Originally, these just used 250 or uh, 300 liter slip tanks. Later versions would have four or 600 liter tanks and so on and so forth. Relatively speaking, it's a small aircraft by today's standards. It's, it's about 33 feet by 33 feet. So it's perfect box nearly. <laughs> uh, it was very much still a subsonic. Uh, cruise speed was a Mach, Mach 0.7. At low altitude near sea level, it could get up to about Mach 0.8. And at high altitude, it could just get over Mach 0.9. Theoretically, it could go faster, especially the biz, but it would lose control, uh, as uh, test pilots soon discovered. So it was really not controllable past 0.9. So not even transonic, really. If you, if you could get it going faster, it, you're lucky to live. So, yeah, these were put into production and service just in time for the Korean War. And, of course, they're a fighter, so they're also armed. In the front, we have a total of three cannon. From the old MiG-9, we still retain a 37mm uh, on the starboard side with 40 rounds. On the port side, we have two 20 three millimeter cannon with 80 rounds each so all told it had 200 rounds on board the reason it went with cannon was initially remember i said that they were worried about the uh, the uh, the b29 and other bombers this was meant to be a bomber interceptor but of course with the korean war it was also put into service as more of a, a dogfighter so yeah it had cannon hard hitting but somewhat limited uh, you know, endurance for their weapons. Under the wings, it could carry the, the tanks, like I said, the slipper tanks, or it could carry about 100 kilos of, uh, you know, a dumb bomb or maybe an unguided rocket pod, but this is well before any type of missiles were really a thing. It could uh, get quite a bit higher than the MiG-9, over 50,000 feet. And with large tanks on the wings, it had a pretty good range of over 1,500 miles. So being a little slow has its benefits, I suppose. It had a sliding canopy, so kind of old school style back here. It's kind of neat that the model does too. And the pilot is removable. And it even had an ejection seat. Not a zero zero. Those didn't exist yet. But, uh, yeah, pretty spiffy. So the, uh, the Biz really quickly replaced the original model, and that's what we're going to see with a lot of Russian planes throughout this video. The first production type is usually made in somewhat small numbers or for a brief period, and then it's replaced by one or two updated generations where they really get things, uh, get things right. So, yeah, these entered into Korea in 1950, first being flown by Russians. 
Then in 51, we had some Chinese flying them. And then in 52, the first North, the first North Korean flown 15s appeared. And uh, when it was introduced, it, it definitely trounced older planes like the F-80. The, uh, the F-84, in the hands of a good pilot, could kind of hold its own. But if the pilot was unskilled, no. Nope. It wasn't until the F-86 was rushed into theater that it had a challenger. People debate on and off which is better, the MiG-15 or the F-86. And that's a, that's a topic for another day. But they were pretty pretty well balanced overall when you really consider all aspects. And, of course, like I said, other people flew them and made them outside of Russia, too. Let's switch the models out now. Here we have a MiG-15 Biz-R reconnaissance version. Very, very similar. It's based on the MiG-15 SB, which was the uh, strike bomber variant. Uh, they were almost the same aircraft. A lot of them were painted with camo. They were designed for a little bit more of dropping ordnance, but yeah. The, uh, the reconnaissance version replaces one of the cannon with a camera. So it has one camera, has one 23 mil cannon, and one 37 millimeter. That's it. So they pulled out one of the cannon to uh, make room for film because the uh, cameras were a lot bigger back then. <laughs> and kids, uh, we used to have to develop film, and it was in black and white. Sepia, of course, because it was old. Now, and you will see some variants kind of going. There was even a variant called the MiG-15P, which they tried equipping with a radar. Not many were made, but it's kind of the first effort at, a, at an radar all-weather equipped interceptor. But still just cannons, so the only other option then was you know unguided rockets, which uh, are of limited utility. But it was uh, you know, time, what they did. Russia would build... A large number in house in country and then of course even more would be constructed by foreign nations Russia would build about 3,000 of the original version but far more of the biz over 13,000 and then another 4,000 or so were built by other nations and uh, after the Korean War it definitely had an under reputation it was also easy to maintain and pretty for easy to train people on how to, how to fly. The uh, the Chinese fluid is the J-2. And uh, Egypt would pick up some in 1955, using them in the Suez Crisis the next year. Vietnam would get MiG-15s, but they would only use them as trainers and you know other kind of behind-the-lines craft. They, they weren't really using them for the, the war in the 60s. And of course, they would just uh, you know spread from there. It's such an iconic aircraft, and I, I love the uh, the kind of cigar-shaped nose, which is one of the things it's kind of named for. And uh, there were plans for a MiG fifteen M or other modernized version. Well, what happened to that? It got better. The MiG-17, initially known to the U.S. Air Force as the Type 38, soon it would be known much more commonly by its NATO reporting name of Fresco. Which I always want to say Fresca, so I didn't that time. <laughs> and yeah, this started off as an improved MiG-15. All the way back in 1949, right as the initial 15 was being shown off, the MiG Design Bureau was charged with um, making a better version. The MiG-15 had a British-inspired engine, but the airframe was kind of based on German research, World War II studies. Now they want, they want to basically make a new airframe. It may not look like it, but it really is. And then you have the Korean War. The, the combat there, especially early on, really helped influence this design. So you have a lot of learning. The, the 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 new plane like originally it was a, you know updated like a, a 15M 
would get enough changes, it would be designated as the MiG-17. It would first fly in 1950. It would actually be ready for production and Russian service by September, October 1951. But because they were supplying 15s for the uh, Korean War, they held off, which actually wasn't so bad. It gave them time to tinker with the design, even though it was in some ways an improvement on an existing design. But uh, regardless, it did enter the Russian Air Force in 1952, although production might be a little slow until the Korean War went in the next year. And from the get-go, there were two versions planned. A tactical fighter, we might call it, for the VVS, and a uh, interceptor for the PVO. So the uh, initial version was known as the Fresco, there you go, Fresco A, and it was armed with the same weapons as the MiG-15. It had the two 23mm cannon and a 37mm cannon. It uh, had an, you know, a new engine type. There would also be the Fresco B, which was radar equipped, and it was armed with three 23 mil cannon instead of the uh, larger one to make room for the radar. While they had tried out radar in the 15P, it was really the uh, the MiG 17P that went into actual production and you know was made in any numbers. And of course, the initial ones were. Uh, just cannon armed as well, so you know, take it for what you will. But they were already working on this version here, known as the MiG 17F or the Fresco C. It had an improved engine with uh, afterburn capability, reheat as the Brits would call it, several other improvements. You would actually get a gun sight inspired, read copied from the F 86 Sabre, and it would get a new ejection seat system copied or at least heavily inspired by the, the Martin Baker ejection seat and uh, several other improvements besides. These would go into service in 1953 and again quickly eclipse the older versions. There would be a MiG-17 PF with the new engine and uh, things would progress from there. When Egypt acquired the MiG-15 and 55 they also got some 17s and uh, they would start to spread around the world. The real first combat debut would come in 1958 during the Taiwan Strait incident. And, uh, they'd, yeah, they would just kind of spread around. And uh, they would be in Russian service, not just with the VVS and PVO, but also the, the Russian Navy would use them as guard-type aircraft. And they would be built in quite large numbers. Over 10,600, including foreign derivatives made in uh, China and uh, the Czechoslovakian nation. The Chinese version would be known as the J-5, although Russian-built examples, or at least planes made with Russian parts, were known as the J-4 some. Overall, it's slightly longer than the 15 at about 37 feet has a t somewhat shorter wingspan of about 32. The wings themselves, though, are quite different. You, it's easy to notice that they have three fences instead of two, but it's actually a compound angle from 45 degree to 42. Kind of neat. New tail. The idea behind this was to make it more controllable, especially at speeds approach, approaching Mach 1 and just a, a better handling aircraft. It was still was subsonic, or at most transonic, but it could go faster. It was faster at sea level, almost approaching Mach 0 0.9, and it could still get up above Mach 0.9 at altitude. And while it really wasn't much faster there than the 15, it didn't lose control in the same way the 15 did. It did have a higher altitude as well, as of over 54,000 feet. And um, several other improvements to the electronics, control surfaces, things of that nature. It did have a slightly shorter range of about 12, 1300 miles, whereas the 15 used 200, 300, 400, 600 tanks. 
the 17 had 400 liter tanks so a little less fuel but also a little more thirsty engine especially with the addition of uh, of reheat there because the wings and frame were strengthened you could also carry more ordnance up to 250 kilograms per wing these were you know bombs rockets and still unguided stuff although this would be in some ways the first russian jet that could have missiles this model isn't really correct and i don't care i stuck a couple of uh, k5ms under it it's also a north vietnamese colored aircraft kind of neat because uh, the mig-17 maybe had its biggest combat showings in the vietnam war especially 1965 in that period let's go back though i wish hobby master would give us a mig-17p but they haven't like i said the original p no uh, no missiles the, the pf no but there was the mig-17 pu introduced around 1956-57 and uh, really progressing on in 1960 because Russia would copy the early AIM-9 Sidewinder resulting in the uh, the K-5 missile. There were some earlier ones they trialed but that's kind of the one that went into major production. Now while they didn't make a ton of uh, 17 PUs, they made some. It was of course still a radar equipped. Some had two missiles, later ones could even have four. They were by standard only two one end reach wing hard points but some late pu's could have a uh, four to carry four missiles because they weren't very reliable it wasn't just russia's fault these early guided missiles were not reliable typically with the uh, late gen one types you might have like ir guided at best so it is what it is but i just kind of wanted one to do it and i wanted to do something special for this one i'm not saying vietnam armed them with missiles i just why don't I always blow them off? But having fun. Vietnam definitely used them, though. The first ones were sent there in 1960. And by 1964, Vietnamese pilots had formed squadrons and were flying them. And in 65, they caused the White House quite a bit of uh, lost sleep when an F-105 Thunder Chief, a.k.a. the Thud, was effectively shot down by a MiG-17. You know, how could a modern jet be shot down by something they viewed as essentially world war ii technology well that's because while american planes had a lot going these were very maneuverable very tight turning and uh quite small hard to hit again missiles at this time were not very reliable no matter who's shooting them and it was able to hit pretty hard with its uh, 37 millimeter cannon or even 23 so as a interceptor kind of controlled from the ground by the Vietnamese doing a defensive war they're pretty effective the Vietnamese would kind of call this type of uh, aerial dogfighting uh, guerrilla style and it would continue on with later versions too but um, yeah the 17 really meant a name for itself between 65 and 70 in uh, Vietnam and considering the relatively low cost of the aircraft versus what american aircraft were going for yeah they could even occasionally go up against like an f4 phantom which you think would just be hopelessly outclassed by but it sometimes managed especially in the hands of very skilled pilots production in russia would end in 1958 and they would be pulled from active service by the late 60s there but yeah vietnam would continue using them as would other nations Fun fact, there was never a two-seat trainer made in Russia. They just used the two-seat version of the 15 as the trainer because they were so similar. Although, China would make the JJ-5 as a two-seater, the only one made. And basically what they did there is they, they took the front end of a MiG-15 and grafted it to the rear section of a 17. China would also introduce its own radar-equipped version as the j 5 a that would appear around 1964-65 but then china would start to go through some troubles and so on and so forth it's an interesting aircraft it often gets overlooked but it was an improvement over the mig-15 in just about every way however it's kind of pushing the british engine specs or the russian engines based on the british to their max and it's 
getting towards the end of canon fighting. Not the, the tail end, but, you know, the end. This is analogous to a late production F-86, or if you want, a late production Meteor in the UK. But it was very easy to operate, simple to maintain, and would remain in several Air Forces through the 60s and uh, into the 70s. But now, we cross over into Generation 2. The second generation of jets really combined the fighter interceptor. And it was short-lived around the world, but a very important transitional step. These planes typically used a combination of cannon. Machine guns are really falling out by this point, And early guided missiles. Like I said, IR, maybe uh, uh, radar guided if they could manage it. Uh, kind of a, a mix. They were also transonic or straight up supersonic. And uh, usually had swept wing or delta wing designs. So, you know, think of the, the French planes. And for Russia, we have two aircraft that really symbolize this. The MiG-19 and the MiG-21. At least the first generation of MiG-21s. So let's dive in. Actually going back to the Korean War again. The MiG-19 Farmer. Got an F thing going on. As far as I know, there wasn't an Air Force designation now. And this model is not Hobby Master, although it is 172 scale die cast. It's actually from uh, Panzerkampf, which is an odd brand. You can tell they're kind of using and recycling molds from other brands because some of theirs are not great quality, and others like this remind me very much of a uh, caliber wings and I hope they do more I did a video when this first came in because I picked it up for my uh, birthday and I really wanted it because it's an interesting design also it was kind of my missing MIG so let's talk about this because it has a pretty interesting place in history it was not only Russia's first supersonic jet to go into production Really, it was the first military jet in the world to go into true mass production. But it also had some major shortcomings, some of which were never really resolved. As early as 1950, the powers that be in the Soviet Union ordered a new aircraft. They wanted supersonic. I think the 15 and letter 17 were so close, tantalizingly close, and it was a bit of point of a pride to get to supersonic. It also has a lot of tactical advantages, too. But and uh, it needed to have more range, blah, 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 blah. You, new technologies is before. We need a radar-equipped version, a fighter version, the usual. And so MiG started working. And they actually had some prototypes as early as 1952. Unfortunately, they were very underwhelming. In fact, they didn't even really achieve supersonic flight. So it's kind of back to the drawing board. In 1954, some more prototypes were flown. And this time we went supersonic, but the planes were just not ready yet. Nevertheless, the politicians needed a win, so they ordered it into service as the MiG-19 and into full production. Even though some test planes were still experiencing a few little issues like, I don't know, exploding into a fireball in the middle of a flight. Typically, you need a missile or gun to do that, but this plane was so advanced it could do that on its own. No, what they found out was they were using two engines. They were the new uh, AM-5 axial jet engine, and they put two together. So it doesn't look like a traditional you know, jet in a way. So we have kind of a split here in the intake. And... Uh, they needed to install a heat shield. And once they did that, it helped. At least not explode. Another thing they revealed in testing was the more traditional tail 
wasn't giving the kind of performance they needed, the kind of control. And so they eventually would go to the T-tail here. And that would introduce this version around 1956. This is the MiG-19S. So the original MiG-19, the Farmer A, really wasn't produced in any numbers of note. It was the 19S that was the first daytime fighter that really was acceptable. And that's what we have here. Now, it is a larger aircraft at about 41 feet long, although its wingspan is a little hair under 30 feet. It is true, supersonic, capable of reaching about Mach 1.2 at altitude, although at sea level it's still subsonic, about 0.9. Hadn't quite crossed that threshold yet. Its maximum altitude is over, over 50, uh, I can't talk apparently, over, over 57,000 feet. And uh, it could carry about the same under the wings. Some had two hard points, later it would have four, although typically of the four, two were reserved for fuel tanks. Because while they wanted this to have a longer range than the 17, 15, because of the two engines, it actually had a range of over, excuse me, of under 900 miles without at least additional tanks slapped on. It could carry the usual unguided rockets or iron bombs although it was really rarely used in that role. Instead, it actually had three cannon. These were 30 millimeter, so kind of splitting the difference. And they moved two to the wing root to uh, get away from gas ingestion from the engines. One was still on the center line, and uh, the center line had 55 rounds. The two wing roots had 75. So, um, you know, about the same overall capacity as the 17, but uh, standardized at about 30 millimeter versus uh, kind of switching between, which makes sense when it comes to sighting, you know, getting everything dialed in. So it was in mass production, but actually only for a pretty brief time in Russia. They would only build about 2,100. That might be a large enough number for the West, but for Russia, it's a drop in the bucket. Although, there were an unknown number made in China is the J6 as well. So you can add more, but we just don't know because of the turmoil that happened at the time. To achieve supersonic flight and actually control, we also had an all-new wing design. About a 55-degree sweep. We were down to just one wing fence. But when you look at the cockpit, the antenna, the sliding canopy, Still very much reminiscent of the older designs. Pretty much the same ejection system. Yada yada. But like I said, there was a radar equipped version known as the MiG 19P. And it would give way, it only had two cannon by the way, and it would give way to the MiG 19PM, which would have four of the K 5 missiles. And of course, you know, they were guided and whatnot. I hope one day that Panzer does a P or a PM. We just don't get a lot of those from things, and I think the Red Arrow equipped versions are neat. I also really like the F-86D, the, the Sabre Dog. Luckily, uh, Falcon gave us quite a few of those back in the day. They're just interesting. If you're thinking this plane kind of sounds like the uh, North American F-100 Super Sabre, yeah, it really was. It might have beat it into service technically, but again, it was more of a political coup. It really wasn't until 57 that they had the, the, the kinks worked out. By which time, technology was already progressing on. And nevertheless, it was used by all three air forces in Russia. The VVS, the PVO, the Naval Aviation. And would remain in frontline service until at least the mid-60s. But most were retired by the time we hit the 70s. Because um, they, just, they never really got it right. In the, and to be fair, the F-100 suffered some similar problems. And I'm not saying the Super Sabre is a bad plane, but this is really pushing technology to the oomph. I remember in 2000, I built my first, you know, one gigahertz computer. Yeah, that was a big deal back then. It, when it worked, it was great, but it was never as stable as computers before it. They were slower or after. It's just when you're pushing that envelope... It's, uh, 
It's hard to get it right. These would have some foreign customers. For example, Egypt would acquire some in the early 60s. They would actually fly them during the Six Days War in 1967. Several would be lost, but they would acquire more. And they would fly them again in 1973 during the Yom Kippur War. But after that, Egypt would turn away from Russia more towards the west, so their service would dwindle. Like I said, China had the J-6 that used those. And while Russia never directly gave North Vietnam any MiG-19s, China did give them some J-6s starting in 1968, and they formed a squadron or two and flew them. Um, yeah, they, they never made quite the impression in that war as other aircraft, but they were there. For example, back in 1965, a Chinese J-6 did shoot down an F-104 uh, Starfighter. And they had some other successes, so, you know, they were there. But it was just, it was that transitional step, and it's what they wanted. And it's also kind of the last in that MiG-15, MiG-17, because it still does resemble them. Don't you think? But it's also the first in this new generation. And, of course, things were progressing, like I said. And now we get to probably one of the very most famous and successful military aircraft of all time and probably ever will be. Some may argue with my decision about the MiG-21 to split it up in between Gen 2 and Gen 3. Oh well, we're just having fun, right? Either way, very important aircraft in history. In fact, it's the most mass-produced supersonic aircraft and really was the most mass-produced military aircraft after the Korean War. You know, back in World War II and even to Korea, aircraft were built in huge numbers. Thousands, tens of thousands. Well, as things became more complicated and modern, numbers would drop. And for a long time, the MiG-21 held the record for longest production run, too. But that has been surpassed by the F-16 and others. But yeah, it started off gen Generation 1 of the MiG-21 is definitely a Generation 2 aircraft. Now, Hobby Master has never given us a true first generation, at least early production model. For one, the first ones had the Pytot tube on the bottom, very much like the MiG-19. In fact, the cockpit and everything looked very similar in the very beginning. But these are very low rate production. This one here is, I believe, from the Czechoslovakian Air Force, too. So, remember how I said the powers that be were pretty demanding about a supersonic aircraft? Well, in 1953, right after the end of the Korean War, they wanted a new lightweight fighter. And the specs were pretty loose, but also pretty demanding. It needed to be mounted with a cannon, of course, have an improved gun sight, radar controlled, and it needed to be capable of Mach 2. So before they even had a Mach 1 aircraft that worked, Let's make a Mach 2. Oh well, they didn't leave a lot of details. They could kind of go there. And, and so the, the MiG Design Bureau actually played around with quite a few designs, wing configurations. You know, had uh, several different concepts on paper, even several prototypes they were flying. In 1956, the Delta Wing prototype first flew. And this would be what was ultimately selected. After that, between 57 and 58, they continued to improve things. They went to an uprated engine. We're using a new uh, turbojet engine for these. And then in 1959, the first version was introduced as the MiG-21F. Like I said, the Pytot tube would be down below. And this was a day fighter. It uh, had two 30mm cannon. And it had provisions for a fuel tank on the center line. And it could mount uh, some dumb fire ammunition under each wing, one little hard point. That's about it. It um, was in very limited production. Fewer than 100 were, were ever made. They were also working on a radar-equipped, a Cypher radar-equipped version for the PVO. It appeared as the MiG-21P in 1960. And uh, was also in limited production. That same year, the MiG-21 F-13 appeared. This was the first 
fighter version to have missiles, the K-13. And to accommodate those, it dropped one of its 30 millimeter cannon, just having one underneath. At the same time, the MiG 21P, like I said, came out and it was equipped with the same K-13 missiles as well as the radar and it was controlled from the ground, had a relatively limited range. These early ones really did. In fact, without a tank, it was like 45 minutes or less flight time. Even with the tank, some of the early ones were about an hour and a half max. Either way, though, they, they paved the way. And the uh, MiG-21 F-13 was actually exported. For example, in 1962, a number were sent to Finland, who was the first non-Warsaw Pact operator of the MiG-21, but far from the last. India would be not only a noteworthy user, but actually the largest user really outside of Russia and China, using over 1,200 as time would go on. Again, over 11,500 were built, not really kind of accounting for, you know, maybe unknown numbers out of China. It's a longer aircraft at 48 feet, but it's narrow at about 23 feet. Russia, because of the Delta Wing, they called it the Belalaika. In Poland, they went more simple, calling, calling it the Pencil. And NATO called it the Fish Bed. It got that name early on. Uh, it kind of makes you wonder how much they were underestimating it. <laughs> In testing, it was Mach 2 capable. And it could actually go supersonic at sea level, although just barely, like 1.1. It had a max altitude of around 57,000 feet, give or take, the model. So about the same as before. And of course, it would get a lot of changes, a lot of fuel tank adaptations, a lot of... It just, oh, it's just, there's so much here. Of course, it would get a new ejection seat system, too. So, this one is a MiG-21 PFM. Interceptor version. Started off around 1962, we had the MiG-21 PF for the PVO and others. It was just you know, all around improvement. It had additional fuel. It, it accommodated a better underbelly fuel tank. Um, it actually did not have, I, I didn't mention it, the MiG 21P didn't have cannon initially. And uh, so we went from there. The deal though, they were still working. There would be a transition to a new missile. The, the, the PF would still use the K-13. But then we would get to the PFM in 1964. There was a transitional model called the PFS, which introduced uh, blown flaps and a new two-stage afterburning engine, but it wasn't really produced in any numbers to talk about. The PFM took that and really ran with it. And that's kind of the definitive radar-equipped version that we see here. And by this point, we have the new K-5 missile. Some of the older PFs could also take the K-5 as they were updated. We have more range. It's still limited, but more. It's got a larger spine. It was around this whole time with the PF and everything. We moved the PyTOT tube from the bottom to the top, so it's kind of easy to tell. And while the initial production models had the standard kind of canopy, with the PFM we went to a new ejection seat that had the new two-piece canopy system, more traditional by our thinking today. And this, it didn't have a zero-zero seat, they still weren't out yet, but it was a zero eighty, so it could eject safely at zero altitude, but it needed to be moving about eighty, so you know things weren't mushed. So we're getting there. And it did introduce, or rather reintroduce, a feature. One that this model does have. First, reduced to one in the uh, later F-13 and pulled entirely away from the P-series, the cannon would return, well, in a gun pack form, so in, still an optional form, with the uh, PFM series around 64, 65. And... Uh, it's kind of neat. It's like everyone kind of has to learn the lesson that cannons still had utility. The downside, I'm going to pull it off and it's stuck. By this point, we've just got the two K-13 missiles. 
and we have this gun pack on the underside. It holds 200 rounds. It's a 23 millimeter instead of 30. And they're a double barrel system. They teeter totter in, out, in, out. It's kind of neat. Of course, this means you can't carry a centerline tank, which means the flight time is well, 60 minutes or less, even though accommodation was made for more fuel internal. But still, if you're just having an interceptor that's guided from the ground, it can zoom up and in addition to just two missiles because the early ones remember were still not all that dependable you could uh, at least you know try your hand at cannon rounds it's interesting that they're going back to the 23 millimeter cannon having 37 23 then 30 and now we're down to this but it makes sense for what we're doing now and steps were made to make these more agile and just you know better handling of course safer with the ejection seat system and uh, we're pretty successful and I'm actually happy that Hobby Master has made a number of the radar equipped version here they are a different style than most of your MiG 21's notice the very slim slim back here and the antenna swept back here the tail would actually get larger with the PFM series better control it's in, it's in all moving tail but we only have three hard points three attachment points still pretty limited electronics in the cockpit oh that nose cone pretty neat it's like they, they took the cigar from the original ones and they gave it a shot cone there and it was meant to be moved in and out for better performance at altitude and speed and stuff yeah so these spread about but most of the interceptor versions were used for Europe for air defense against larger or invading aircraft and it was only the beginning because, yeah, in 1964-65, the MiG-21 is just getting started. In fact, production wouldn't end in Russia until 1985. And outside of Russia, like, say, China, for much, much longer it last. And uh, stay in service. For example, the, the PVO in Russia would still be flying these when the USSR collapsed. And would continue to do so into the 90s. As would other nations. Because it worked. It was simple, easy to maintain, dependable. It had shortcomings, namely range, but uh, a lot else going on. I really like this gun pack. It's neat. You could always pull it off and put on a fuel tank. It came with both. And the wings were not wet plumbed. And that's what I'm considering Generation 2. The next set you might consider Generation 2 slash 3. We'll see. Either way, I'm going to break Gen 3 up in the two little sections here. How do we define a third generation fighter jet? Of course, when the designers were doing these, they weren't thinking in terms of generation. That's how historians, collectors, hobbyists do things just to differentiate. You know, for example, submachine guns. We often think of generation one, two, three, but that's just a way to organize. The generation three is classed as Planes developed in the 60s or 70s, built to primarily use improved guided missiles, but also cannon as a backup. Built not only as a fighter, but also with more emphasis on ground attack as a secondary. We're not quite to multi-role true yet, but it's there. They were all built with radar for the most part. They were supersonic, and um, most of them have improved avionics electronics, new designs and, you know, technology, and uh, usually have more user-friendly cockpits, gauges, controls. So I definitely think the later variants of the MiG-21 kind of fit in there. Believe it or not, I didn't actually bring out every single MiG-21 I ended up having. That's what happens when you collect for years. Um, but I've brought out some just to kind of show different things. And this is most of it. I think I only have a couple I didn't bring out. And these are all going to be Hobby Master. Fun fact, if you have a Corgi MiG-21, it's actually made by Hobby Master, or rather the same factory in China. 
And to begin, we're going to go to what we consider the second generation of the fish bed, the MiG-21, with this aircraft here, which is actually one of my favorites in my collection. Meet the MiG-21R, R because it's a reconnaissance model. Developed in 1964, really kind of following everything going on with the PF, PFM series, these debuted in 65, went into full production around 66, and uh, were very advanced reconnaissance aircraft for Russia at the time. And they also really pushed the MiG-21 design to the next level. They didn't just throw on a recce pod. They went from two to four hard points under the wings because the center line, which had previously, you know, contained the fuel was now going to be taken up by the uh, camera pod. The, they had a few different pods. They had a day daytime. They had a nighttime pod. They even had a TV pod. That'd be a hell of a reality show, amongst others. So that was taking up the center line. It was still wet plumbed, but it's reconnaissance. What are you going to do? So they plumbed two new points on the outside of the wings so that it could carry two fuel tanks instead of one. Because, uh, you know, the, the, the standard F or uh, P models were point interceptors, you know, local fighters. But reconnaissance needs more range, more endurance. They also left the two inner points for weapons. Typically, they would carry air-to-air -air missiles, the K-13, for self-defense. But they could carry rocket pods or bombs if it was a reconnaissance strike mission. But it did not have any cannon on board. It could theoretically take the gun pack, the 23 mil pack from the PFM, but rarely if ever was fitted with this. And of course, if they did that, wouldn't have the, the pod. It also had a slightly larger spine here. For more avionics, electronics, a bit more fuel. And this is when we have the PyTot tube moved to the uh, starboard side there, offset. That's to make room for a new sensor. It's an angle of attack sensor on the nose there, right behind the engine intake. We also start to see, of course, the use of the new ejection seat and canopy. And several other changes. This still uses the original R11 engine, and in most other ways is, is pretty conventional. But these were made for a number of years and used by the Soviet Union. There are also a couple of export models, no, namely known as the 21RF. And Egypt even did one with an internally mounted camera system, freeing up the center line point again. But that's only the beginning. The R was heavier than previous MiGs, but it had more capabilities, mainly the, the five attachment points instead of three. This did slow its rate of climb a little bit and maximum top speed a bit, but it wasn't enough to truly impact performance, so things went ahead. For their own domestic use, Russia developed the 21S a short time later, S for Sepfer, the radar system. And it would have f up to four missiles, typically the K-13. And so basically it was, a, it was a fighter version of the reconnaissance model. All the pros and cons that that would entail. But like I said, that was only for Russian service. They did have plans, though, for export. As they were wont to do. When it came time to make an export model of the 21S, Russia had the 21M, which was basically the same plane, but it had an older version of the Sapphire radar. This would be the first version licensed produced in India, so it's kind of notable for that. The 21M was also the first version to have this feature here. Now, this isn't a 21M, this is a 21MT, but... The 21M was the first to have the integrated 23mm cannon on the belly. Still 200 rounds, but it allowed the use of the 
center line point again. It also greatly reduced drag from having not having a pod hanging down there, so that made sense. So that's kind of why the 21M is, uh, is noteworthy. And it would directly lead to the 21MT here and SMT. So let's talk. There's a few things that happen. Late production 21Ss were pretty much the same plane, except we would go to an improved R13 engine around 1969, 1970. But in an attempt to get more fuel, we go to this fat spine back here. So we basically take our 21S, 21M, and we give it more fuel for sp and, and more avionics. The downside is uh, it just didn't handle all that well. There was also a 21SM, but I'm trying to not, not get too much into the weeds here. Interestingly, the 21MT was meant for export, but they would only build about 15 and they would never leave Russia. But it's an important transitional step, and we're still in the second generation of 21s, but we're kind of getting towards the end. This is a neat model from Hobby Master that they did a while back, and I decided to kind of keep this one clean. It did come with ordnance, but it's kind of nice to have one just stripped down. So I can show things. Also because I have this other one here. This is the 21 SMT. Again, S for radar. M was when they modernized it with the new engine. And then T was when they added the saddle tank on top. So it kind of had all the improvements at the time. At least what they thought to be improvements. As it turned out, while we had more fuel, there were more endurance, the pilots really kind of complained about its handling. So a lot of these eventually had the tank removed. But they could carry up to four air-to-air -air missiles. We're still mostly relying on the K-13 at this point, at least early 70s. The SMT has the best radar on offer. And there is an export model that will come out a short time later, the 21MF, which does have you know, an interesting feature. It's one of the first I can recall that can use the new at the time R60 missile a lightweight air-to-air -air missile short range but you know kind of the next step forward again leaning into that third generation of improved guided missiles now I don't like this one I just have this one because uh, I don't know every time I see a new variant I think it's kind of neat to pick it up and it is Russian it does have the uh, fat spine still you know like I said I went ahead and fitted it with the uh, four could have done the fuel tank, but oh well. And it does have the gun pod underneath. And that's um, really where our second generation ends, with the SMT or the uh, MF. There was another version called the ST, which had the, you know, different things. They go back and forth. Again, they're trying things. But in 1972... They really strike gold. Basically, the MiG-21 Biz, again Biz basically being plus, was designed and ended up being the ultimate, the definitive version. Although, it would change enough during its production run that NATO would give it two different names. Fishbed L, Fishbed N. It just kind of depends. It started with the SMT, but they tapered the hump back some. So not quite as much fuel in there. Also, it had new avionics, new control systems, so a little bit smaller. It was also made lighter using newer composite materials, you know, developing what was coming around. This one here I have in a pretty typical configuration traditional we still got the 
two uh, K-13 missiles, and we have two tanks on the outboard points. The this would end up with the uprated, improved engine as well, which gave it a decent amount of lift. It can carry up to 4,400 pounds of stores, including uh, some early uh, air-to-surface missiles, and it could carry bombs, rockets, that kind of thing. It was very successful for what it was. And while it never completely fixed all the shortcomings, it did most of them. It wasn't quite as fast to climb, didn't have quite the altitude as some of the early versions, but it had better endurance. It could carry more, was just more flexible, improved systems, situational awareness, and uh, these are very popular. In fact, three different factories would build these within Russia alone, not to mention various export models. For example, it was manufactured without a license in China as the J7. Now, the Hobby Master model of the J7 isn't really 100% correct, but I wanted to bring it out just to acknowledge China, also because it does have uh, rocket pods on the wings, and I just wanted to show the uh, air to ground attack ability. That's another feature of Generation 3 fighters. They're just they're more focused on ground attack, close support compared to previous so I wanted to show that this definitely had that ability and it started to be used more even if it wasn't initially designed as such that's how flexible it was and with the biz too they were able to make it more maintenance friendly easier to maintain just durable but uh, like I said J uh, China they made the J7 but it wasn't with license Russia had sent them some of the early MiG-21 F's MiG-21 F-13's but then relations had fallen apart so they reverse engineered later variants so they have their own Chinese things going on I've done videos long ago in the past on those I wish Hobby Master had made a proper one but on the other hand that would have required a whole new tooling a whole new mold I get it let's put some Chinese symbols and markings on it still gives the point and uh, they were building these into the 90s and 2000s in fact they had quite a late start because of the troubled times that would befall China in the 70s which delayed a lot of aircraft programs again I've done a number of videos on Chinese aircraft in the past you can look those up on the channel and maybe one day I'll revisit them but I just wanted to acknowledge it and also show a uh, 21 style with the uh, with the pods under the wings it's a relatively thin spine and again the biz could mount some pretty advanced weapons too here we have an example from the Croatian Air Force quite a famous one it's one of only three they used in the 1990s but I brought it out because it has four of the at the time new R60 missiles on it you might say they should be on the inboard pylons you are probably right but this model didn't come with R60s I put them on and they didn't want to fit properly on the inboard so outboard they went besides it's a MiG-21 you can do anything you want with Bondo and duct tape in real life not to mention models so oh well but yeah I just wanted to show one with a total of six missiles on it I thought that was kind of neat Plus it does have the 23 mil cannon. So this is about as armed up as they're going to get. And these never were really built for guided air-to-surface missiles, at least not initially. Again, though, users have uh, done some amazing things to modernize these. For example, India, the largest really user we can think of outside of Russia and China. They first assigned agreements with Russia in 61, getting the early versions. They would first see some small but noteworthy combat against Pakistan in 1965 they would start license producing the M version in 69 70 in that time they would also produce later versions and uh, continue to fly and update them until well today back before the coup they were still flying roughly a hundred MiG-21s although you know they they started to be superseded 
by newer planes, but you know they they served in the uh, Indian Air Force for a very long time and had some interesting upgrades done to them. Uh, probably quite most famously, Vietnam. Russia sent the first MiG-21s in 1966. There, by 1972, there were four complete squadrons flying the MiG-21, and they actually made quite an impact when Operation Linebacker started off again with Linebacker 2. And for some pilots, they clearly were better than the 21. Others still liked the older 17s. They thought the 17 was tighter turning, had better visibility, was more of a pilot's plane. They could feel it. They could really get in there and dogfight good with their cannon, you know, just twist and turn in. And the fact that it wasn't supersonic didn't really matter for their defensive purposes. But other Vietnamese pilots liked the speed and the climb, just the power of the 21. And they were more uh, familiar and skilled with the air-to-air missiles it carried. By the late 60s, early 70s, the K-13 and the improved K-13R were better. Uh, Early on, when the MiG-21 came in against the early F-4, it held its own really well, all things considered. But as U.S. pilots learned the plane and learned their planes and newer versions of the F-4 Phantom came in, you know, it... uh, you know, did better. Of course, it did also lead to the top gun's goal of, you know, unequal asymmetric aerial warfare and uh, all kinds of fun stuff. So it definitely made an impact on America, too. And, of course, the Vietnam War helped develop the biz model in Russia, seeing uh, what did and didn't work there for it. The MiG-21 also made inroads into the Middle East. Not much in Egypt, because by the time it was really ready for export, relations with Russia were already falling apart, so pretty limited, although they had some. Uh, Iraq used them in the Iran-Iraq War, and it went up against all kinds of Western aircraft, the F-4, various helicopters, the F-14, and while Iraq did lose a number of MiG-21s, it is worth pointing out that one of theirs did successfully shoot down an Iranian F-14. Kind of a one-off incident, but worth pointing out, I think, because it's uh, pretty remarkable, because the uh, F-14 is a solid Generation uh, 3 aircraft. I'm sorry. And, uh, yeah, the 21 we can kind of debate. Either way, yeah. They would uh, serve for a very long time in various militaries, some of them not retired until the 19, the end of the 1990s, like in Russia, the PVO and the VVS both flew them, and others to boot. I could go on and on, so many interesting variants, but oh well. I guess, I guess I did want to add, though, that uh, Vietnam did not retire theirs until about 10 years ago. I liked them. And what's nice is, since it's such a maintenance-friendly aircraft and it wasn't really relying on computers quite yet, you can just keep refurbishing them, redoing them, rebuilding them over and over and over. It's kind of like with automobiles. You can rebuild 50s and 60s cars for pretty much forever, (laughs) replacing parts as needed. But you get into, say, cars from the 90s and early 2000s and whatnot, is they rely more and more on electronics, computers, circuit boards. It doesn't really get cost-effective to continue to improve them. And the MiG-21 is like that. And we actually will see it with its successor, and success, or rather lack thereof. But I will end by saying, you know, with the MiG-15, you had about 20 nations flying it. The MiG-17, about 25. The MiG-19, you you had fewer than a dozen. The MiG-21, though, over 60. And not even half were in the Warsaw Pact. This was really where Russia made an impact around the world. Of course, America would respond with the F-16 and kind of have similar results, but this goes to show you a good plane is a good plane. But it wasn't a perfect plane. So, now let's lead on into a solid third generation set of planes. How many times can I say planes? Planes, 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 planes.
The MiG-23 is not disputable. It is a third generation, and MiG developed it specifically to replace the 21. Although, it didn't quite work out that way. And before we talk about it, we actually have to talk about the MiG-25, which you might think came after the 23. In some ways it did, in some ways it did not. And this was developed primarily for the PVO, although a variant would be operated by the VVS as well. It hits, in a lot of ways, the opposite of the 23. This was a short takeoff and landing as much as they could, tactical fighter. This was a high-performance interceptor, high out, high speed. In fact, it's set dozens of records in its time, some of which stand today. But it also had some major shortcomings. Actually, both of these did, but also major successes. So we're going to start with the 25. I know we recently looked at it in the Foxhound video, but it wouldn't be a complete study on MiGs if we didn't talk about it here, right? And then we'll get into the 23 of Afghan war fame. So NATO named the last one Fishbed. This one they designated Foxbat. You can almost tell how much of a threat or how much esteem they have for a plane based on the reporting name. I know they're supposed to be basically at random, but I'm not sure I always believe that. And the reason they thought it was such a threat, at that time, a large wing of this style was considered to be endemic of very good performance. The West thought this was a almost what we think of today as an air superiority fighter, at least before they got their eyes on one up close and personal in Japan. But Russia, well, this was developed for an entirely different reason, which actually goes all the way back to kind of where this video began. As I said, the PVO is tasked with defending Russian airspace, and bombers like the B-58 Hustler and the B-70 Valkyrie, while they really didn't amount to much in the end, were of great concern to Russia in the 1950s. And the uh, MiG Design Bureau took note. Previous interceptors that the PVO had were adapted from other designs. You know, the MiG-21 we just talked about, the P version, which was reasonably successful, but it was a short-range point defense interceptor, relatively light, short-range missiles. You know, the, the MiG-15P didn't really do much. The MiG-17PM had missiles, but still pretty short-range. Yeah, they needed something with more range, more endurance, and with missiles capable of themselves traveling further and hitting larger targets that could surely knock them out. And in 1959, the powers that be made this known. We need a new interceptor aircraft capable of exceeding about 1,800 miles per hour, getting up to nearly 90,000 feet, carrying air-to-air -air missiles, of course, with a powerful radar, so on and so forth. And uh, two companies, MiG and Suhoi, really stepped up to the challenge. Suhoi, today we know, thanks to the SU-27, and they were making aircraft, but you know you don't hear much about the, the SU-7, SU-9, SU-15. And... Uh, Unfortunately, we don't really have models of these in one set issue doubt it is scaled die cast either, or I would be happy to talk about them. But I don't want to say they were secondary to MiG, but they were kind of secondary to MiG. They also focused more on like ground attack and other type things, whereas MiG was doing the more fighter and interceptor. It was just, it, this was MiG's time. And it didn't hurt that they'd been kind of workshopping on their off hours, different interceptor designs for at least the last few years because you know, they, they could see which way the winds were blowing. And in 1962, yeah, they, they pretty much won the competition and uh, given the go-ahead to build prototypes. And when they were designing what would be known as the MiG-25, they looked at a lot of things. They did consider a two-seat design, but uh, decided to go single-seat. That way it could be controlled from the ground. They 
considered several ways of arranging the engines, different types of engines. Heck, they even considered like lift jets for like V-stall liftoff uh, so they could get into the air faster. They, they looked at a lot of things. They also considered using titanium quite liberally, but this would have been cost prohibitive. So they went with nickel steel, stainless steel, and using less than 10% titanium just really where it was necessary. They also used a few other elements and alloys in the hull. But uh, yeah, stainless steel with about 10% titanium is kind of the main mix there. Anyway, there would be two main versions. The 25R reconnaissance for the VVS. And the 25P, the main one, radar equipped for the PVO. Both prototypes would test fly in 1964, first the R, then the P. But it would be a little while before full rate production would begin. There were reasons we can go into in a full video if you like, and I've done it in the past. But in 1967, they started to show them off to the world. Finally, in 1969, full rate production was approved for the R variant, and it went to the VVS a very short time later. The P version would be a little bit behind. Full rate production would start in 71, and it would start to appear in the PVO in 1972. This is a large aircraft compared to what we've seen from MiG up to this point. In fact, it's the second largest we're going to look at in this video. It's about 65 feet long with a 46 foot wingspan. Quite heavy, it was said. It relies on one operator, so he's got a lot going on, frankly. It has a Sapphire A smirch type radar system. It is a two band system, very powerful, but it was not looked down, shoot down capable. This had quite an impressive altitude thanks to its uh, R25 engines. We've got two of them. With full combat load, so four missiles, it could get up to nearly 70,000 feet. With two missiles, up to nearly 80,000. And test models easily exceeded 100,000. Later variants would bump that to over 120,000. So yeah, pretty good performance and altitude. It also had very good uh, climb rate, so it could really zip up there. As far as speed, it's a bit controversial. At sea level, low altitude, it still was not supersonic. So it was about Mach 0 0.9. So not a lot faster than some of the later like MiG-17s. But in altitude, it could exceed... Mach 2.8 safely or up to 3.2 but you're gonna do permanent damage to your engines and aircraft so let's not do that cruise was around Mach 2.3 and you'll notice this does not have a drop tank originally it did not have any kind of external fuel storage rather it had a massive wing which was also a wet wing nearly three quarters of the available volume inside the airframe was given over to fuel because this needed endurance it needed range but it also had two very thirsty very large jet engines it was okay i mean it's better than the little mig 21 if we're uh, going at you know full throttle we're gonna get up we're going to get a little over a thousand miles range you know about Mach 2.3 if we slow that down to just under the sound barrier we can extend the range about 150 miles to about 1160 on the range so it's okay um it just kind of depends no guns powerful radar because we have Four large powerful missiles these are the R40 we have two types there is the T and the D excuse me the T and the uh, R one is a thermal IR other one is a radar controlled and you can actually tell the difference it would actually carry two and two the uh, tip would either be 
slimmer and pointed or a little bit more bulbous and rounded. Originally this had a detection range of about 60 miles with the tracking and everything range of about 30. Later versions would improve upon this. But uh, for the day and time, it was quite impressive. Even if the bombers it feared never came to fruition, it was still important. In fact, it also made the reconnaissance version more important than they maybe first planned. So yeah, full rate production would begin between 69 and 71, depending on the variant. But they wouldn't actually make a lot of these. In fact, it's probably the smallest number we've seen up to this point. Under 1,200 total production would end in uh, around 1984 but that also gets into other variants we'll talk about and that's because originally this was meant for russian use only they had not planned to export it but well history kind of found a way to laugh in their face and this aircraft here victor blancos which we talked about in the recent video is exactly the reason why this was also the very first release from hobby master and as far as I know, it's the only one they've done in the true MiG 25P standard. So let's talk about the differences between P, PD, and PDS. Boy, that sounds a little bad, doesn't it? Did YouTube just censor me? With the MiG 25's introduction to service, the MiG Design Bureau it was it was it was the end of an era. This was the last aircraft that. Mikhail Gogorovich himself worked on before retiring. So, yeah, there'll still be new MiGs, but end of an era going all the way back to World War II and the original MiG jets. Anyway, the reconnaissance variant, we're going to start there because it was the first to actually see any field use. It had cameras in the nose, and in 1971, four under Russian control, being flown by Russians, would be sent to Egypt to do uh, overflights over Israel. They would be removed, but then they would come back a short time later in 1973 for the Yom Kippur War, and be removed again the next year. Kind of interesting. Now, the R variant was only made in small numbers because it would soon give way to the 25RB, the reconnaissance bomber variant, and I really hope Hobby Master maybe one day makes that. That would be a neat one. Same thing, cameras, but it could carry four 500 kilogram dumb bombs, iron bombs. Later variants could uh, carry up to 10. But that would be neat to have. They also made a uh, UT two seat trainer variant, but these were built in quite limited numbers. So the majority were the 25p here again can't remember if i said sapphire or smirch but this had the smirch a radar sorry it could detect targets as low as 500 meters and as high as 27,000. we talked about its range it was powerful but the west really didn't know what this plane could and couldn't do until 1976 when lieutenant blanco defected and they got to study this for about two months they had the plane from september till november and being polite they returned it to russia there's a fun story about when they got it back everyone knew what they did because russia would have done the exact same thing if it, they got their hands on a western fighter they returned it in crates after fully disassembling it and studying it and russia sent a bill to japan because they said some parts were missing probably so well, Japan ret retaliated by sending Russia a bill for the damage done to their airfield and other expenses when it came to their territory. So it was kind of a one of those funny things. I, that would have been a fun... We should see that on Judge Judy. That'd be great. But uh, they got to study it. They realized, yes, it does have good climb, good high speed, good altitude, but it handles like a pig. It's not a dogfighter. They were at first afraid it would be a dogfighter. And at low altitudes, it really doesn't maneuver well. It has limitations. The radar has limitations. The missiles, while good and powerful, 
also had some limitations, it gave them a much more realistic view. They went from fearing it to, you know, respecting it, but also realizing it was built with a bit of a old school technology. As is famously reported, the electronics had vacuum tubes. Part of it was Russia knew it. Uh, Russia was kind of behind on the semiconductors, the solid state stuff compared to the U.S. at that time. But also they were really good at making vacuum tubes and they were simple, easy to replace. Uh, they were proved against the EMPs and they were better in cold environments. I can't imagine why Russia would do that. So while it was a bit of a savings measure, it also had some benefits to them. And again, this is a single seater, so you're giving the pilot a whole lot to do. Now, in theory, he would be directed controlled from the ground. And this would work out fine, except the data link, the communications at the time were, by necessity, quite limited. So, could be better. Either way, knowing that the specs for the radar and the missiles were out, MiG, Russia, quickly scrambled to replace the MiG-25P in 1978 with the MiG-25PD. Here we have it here. You can tell it from the original because the nose is longer. That's to house the new Sapphire radar. This radar is actually connected with our next plane over here, we'll talk about in a minute. It also has a new infrared sensor bulge ferrule on the underside, a little square thing you can tell. Another avionics and updates, you know, so just more room. To go along with the new radar, we have updated versions of the R-40 missile, both T and R variants. These are known as TD and RD. Just better range. In fact, this new system could detect targets up to 30,000 meters and quite a bit lower at as low as 50 meters. So, yeah, ground clutter is less impacting here. This new radar set has somewhat limited look down shoot down capability, but it is look down shoot down, whereas the original was not. Engines and everything are upgraded a bit, but still pretty much the same. These could still carry four of the R-40s, but now we could also, or instead carry on the outboard pylons, a total of four R-60 air-to-air short-range defense missiles. This is a relatively new little missile at the time. Even though it was a limited range, really good maneuverability, lightweight, you could mount it on a lot of things. The, the R-60 for its day and time was pretty spiffy. Still no cannon though. The construction is pretty much the same. And they only built about 150 factory R, excuse me, PDs. Most were upgraded P's. These are called PDS. So at an S, that means it's a P updated to PD standard. The uh, RB variant, we get an upgrade to. One thing to point out, the PD, PDS, and later RBs could also mount a large fuel tank on the center line. If an RB had the tank, it could only carry uh, four 500 kilogram bombs in the tank or 10 bombs in no tank. So that plus the wet wing really did help with range and endurance too. But I don't believe the original P could carry that tank. There were plans to do a MiG-25M, but they were scrapped for reasons that will become quite obvious. And since the technology and, and specs of the aircraft were kind of out, they decided to go ahead and export these. This one here is from Libya. They would acquire nearly a hundred R, excuse me, yeah, RBs and uh, P. DS's from Russia starting in the late 70s running through the early 80s. These would actually be seen during the Gulf of Sidra affair in the 1980s against US F-14s. Syria would also fly a number in the 80s during various conflicts with Israel. But maybe the most important user 
was a rock. In fact, all of the MiG 25s air to air victories were in Iraqi service. In the 1980s, they used them against Iran. And in the Gulf War in 1991, of course, they went against the U.S. Allied coalition forces. And while many MiG 25s were shot down or destroyed on the ground during that war, it has to be noted that on January 17, an Iraqi MiG 25 Foxbat shot down an F A 18 Hornet. Then, just about two weeks later, January 30, another one damaged a MiG, excuse me, an F 15. So, yeah, not a complete kill, but I wanted to point that out just to show that this was about the most capable fighter interceptor that Iraq had at the time. And part of it was having those R-60 missiles. And the, the R-40 had its purpose, but it was a pretty big, long-range, but big thing, so a little hard to maneuver around a small little fighter. And these would spread out. For example, Ukraine would get some after the disillusionment of the USSR. And Russia would continue to fly the MiG-25 into the 21st century. But officially, it was declared obsolete and retired from active service in uh, 2013 during Russia's modernization program for the VKS, as it was starting to be known. This is a neat one here. Like I said, it's... Uh, Liberian. I have an Iraqi one too, I showed in the previous video with the belly tank on. It is a huge tank. But this is such a large model. I only wanted to get two out for this video. It is one of my favorites though. It's very iconic from the Cold War. And our next aircraft has an interesting place as well. So let's jump into what you would think would come before the 25, but actually came after the MiG-23. NATO reporting name, Flogging Molly. The Flogger. Not what everyone thinks of when they think of MiG, but it's kind of sneaking one of my underdog favorites. After the two engine 19 and 25, we're back to a single engine. Why is this the 23 and the 25 is, you know, that they really almost were totally concurrent. Work began in the very early 60s for a next generation fighter to replace the MiG-21. The idea for MiG was carry newer and more weapons, better range, better speed, just better performance, you know, the usuals. The VVS wanted better takeoff and landling, landling, landing performance as well as ability to take off from shorter runways, so kind of forward airfield type things. And they wanted it to be a fighter, which is why single engine, relatively small. Although maneuverability wasn't their utmost, they had other requirements that kind of su superseded it. So while maneuverability was a factor when they were designing this, it wasn't number one, and it does show in the first versions. And, uh, yeah, radar was to be standard using newer missile types. And it's actually here that the early sapphires come from, sapphires, that will be integrated into the MiG-25PD, a variant of it, rather. But anyway, the uh, the program was given the official go-ahead in 63, and strangely, two design teams at MiG kind of worked against each other for two different concepts. Again, that short takeoff and landing, one team wanted to put lift jets, so basically V-stall, kind of like a Harrier. Another team was going with the variable geometry wings, and you already know which one was picked. Both prototypes flew in 1967, and after evaluating for a couple of months, late that year, the variable wing geometry, the sweep wing geometry version was picked. It had several reasons, and it was kind of always meant to be. Um, really, the 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 V style one looked more like a MiG twenty one with a couple of jets put in. There's downsides to jets, especially if you're wanting range, because you know once they take off, it's dead weight unless you have moving parts and so on and so forth. Regardless, 1968 was a development year. 1969, it was authorized for full rate production, 
and would enter the VVS, especially the Ford Regiment, in 1970. At least that was the theory. The first version, the MiG-23S, was a bit of a failure. Uh, it was just not ready for prime time. They only made about 60. And uh, yeah, it did have a radar. It did have the wings, but it just wasn't ready. They revised it a good bit and then released the MiG-23, sometimes called the Model 1971. They would make a few more of these, about 100. It was better, had a larger wing an upgraded engine. This was the first one that could mount the underbelly fuel tank, but uh, it too just really wasn't ready for prime time. It was the MiG-23M, first flown in 1972, that's the model here. Well, this is the MF, the export model meant for the Warsaw Pact, but yeah, the M was for the, uh, the VVS. And this is the one that was put into full rate production, would be built for a number of years in the 1970s, and would be reasonably successful, although they would continue to have some problems, as you would expect, with new technology. So, was this an improvement on the MiG-21? Kinda? Let's get into the basic specs. Overall length is about 55 feet, and with the wings fully deployed out, it's about 46 feet. You would have the wings out like this for takeoff and landing. Also, low altitude slash low speed kind of maneuvering, what have you. But typically, you'd have them about mid-level. Roughly about here. And yes, the model does move. And what I like about it, the wings are geared together. Now, you still want to move them with each hand on one just to keep the pressure even but they should stay more or less in uh, sync with each other on these hobby masters but yeah this is the standard cruise mode flight mode also just kind of standard fighting at medium altitude you know just dog fight this is, this is kind of the standard that we would get to and fully swept back like this was for high performance like high altitude high speed or dashing from high to low, kind of in a strike attack. And when fully swept in, it's about 25 and a half feet wide. Although this configuration would probably be the least common to see it in normally, but it's there when extra speed is needed. So that's the wing setup. As far as speed, it's actually pretty similar to the MiG. At sea level, it can go supersonic, although just about 1.1. And at altitude, it is a little faster than the later MiG-21s. It can get up to about Mach 2.3. So, its max speed is about the same cruise speed as the MiG-25. And it likes to cruise at about uh, one and a half times the speed of sound, give or take, depending on its profile. It does have the Sapphire radar because it was developed, or rather a new missile, which was beyond visual range missile, was the R-23, both the thermal and uh, radar guided variants. Now, you kind of had to pick. Do you want two thermals or two radar? They're on the outer pylons there, on the wing gloves. On the inner pylons, we can carry shorter air-to-air -air missiles. This has two R-60s, which was the first loadout for the M and MF. And then the fifth pylon or hard point in the middle was almost always taken up by a fuel tank because this was a thirsty bee. Um, it used an R-27 engine, and um, because of its takeoff and landing performance, it uh, sucked fuel fast. That whole longer range didn't really work out in fact some versions could couldn't really go much over 700 miles now you could put up to four fuel tanks underneath at least with some versions but that would be more of a transit thing if you do that you have no hard points left over for weapons but it's possible if you just need to you know travel somewhere these are meant to be stationed in more forward bases and kind of strike and short to medium duration missions 
at that. Mostly air to air, but they did have limited ground attack from the beginning. Uh, rocket pods and uh, dumb bombs. Each pylon could carry up to 500 kilograms. And depending on the mix, um, you know, you could have two to 3,000 kilograms in stores, depending on exactly which variant we're at. It could also carry up to 16 smaller 100 kilogram bombs or anything in between. So it had some, but nothing guided in the beginning. I really like the look of this plane. It is uh, special. Now we do have a cannon because they learned their lesson with the MiG-21. We have a 23 millimeter cannon with 260 rounds. It's there if needed. And the Soviet versions could carry tactical nukes. The export versions, the MF, the Flogger B, could not. And they had a few other minor aviation changes. The, the MF was intended for Warsaw Pact and other friendly communist nations. For unaligned or third world nations, they had another special version. Meet the MiG-23 MS. This was the export model that was pretty majorly downgraded and it's quite evident it has a shorter nose because it has a much less effective radar in fact it isn't even capable of beyond visual range missiles some of the other avionics are also downgraded and typically these flew with the older k5 and our three missiles that we've seen on the MiG-21 and then really go back to being inspired by the uh, AIM-9. To be fair, the R-23 was indirectly inspired by the AIM-7 Sparrow, but it was somewhat improved on it. So yeah, this is a visual range aircraft gun. This one has four missiles, pretty much what it has, and of course, limited ground attack. And uh, these were put into production in 1973, so right after the M and MF. And very quickly, Syria was one of the first customers, and they would fly theirs against Israel during various things. And the next year, Libya would get some, and they again would fly theirs against several different things into the 80s and at first they were okay but as they got to know the limitations and really started to see that this wasn't much better than the MiG-21 and it had higher cost of operation was more difficult and time consuming to maintain was more difficult to fly and while we're in the certainly the second generation of floggers they still had some bugs to work out so what happened around 1978, Russia finally gave up on the MS, took it out of production, and just started selling the MF to anyone who wanted it. Maybe since I'm still downgrading, but eventually they would get the, the BVR capabilities and the improved uh, missile system. Although, to be fair, at that time, the MF itself was getting dated. Still was effective enough, but they were already moving on to the next generation, the MiG-23 ML. In the late 70s, the MiG-23 got a second lease on life because the planned and still in development upcoming fourth generation fighters were taking longer than expected, as were their ordnance. So, the 23 ML program started L basically for lightweight. I should also mention that there was a 23P, which had an uprated uh, radar and better data link, better communications with the ground. That was used by the v, uh, PVO. Sorry, I thought I heard knocking. Turned out that was a cat playing in the window. Anyway, so yeah, the, the PVO had their own version, and they actually seemed to kind of like it. Um, makes sense, the short range kind of air defense, yeah. And uh, they actually got a kill in 1979. They shot down an Iranian helicopter that wandered into Soviet airspace, making them one of the first Russian units to, to use it. But 
late that year, the Afghan War would start, and that's where this model is featured from. And uh, that would really be the proving ground for the new version. It was lighter, like I said. Sorry, I'm just moving a cord. Nearly 3,000 pounds, so. And they did remove the spine fuel tank, which you'd think would give it shorter range, but not really. Even though it also had an upgraded engine and could carry more payload, because of the weight savings and better aerodynamics, they reworked the wings again, several other things. It actually saved a bit on fuel and gave better maneuverability, was a better fighter than before. Just because the VVS thought they didn't want maneuverability in the 60s doesn't mean by the 70s, changing warfare, they didn't because it was going up against the F-16 and other more modern jets. Okay, that time there really was knocking. Anyway, yeah, it was lightened, had new engine, had uh, an autopilot, it had uh, better. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, the uh, MiG-23 started off with kind of the 080 ejection seats that we've seen before, but uh, by the M generation, we had our first true 00. We also had pretty advanced heads-up display for that day and time. The, the newer versions could also mount gun pods for the first time, as well as carry more unguided ordnance. But uh, the main missiles really didn't change. You had the R-23. They were hoping to use the new R-27, but it was still in development and wouldn't be ready until the mid-80s. And initially, the MiG-23 carried two R-60s, but in the mid-70s, they developed the double pylon, like you see here, so it could carry up to four kind of making use of its limited hardpoint space. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty radical difference. The tail is a different shape. They reworked the wing, the glove box, the wing gear system was reworked again. One neat little thing, this fin under the engine actually folds for landing. And they gave it a new, stronger, and taller front landing gear. They also gave it an IR sensor, infrared sensor down under the nose and uh, this one has chaff and flare dispensers on the back and uh, other ECM pretty neat and it uh, was pretty useful in the in the war there in Afghanistan now this is the MLD technically and the D was essentially improvement model and that gets convoluted. ML, MLD, they're almost used interchangeably. That's because the VVS never actually got new production MLDs. Rather, after the ML was taken out of production in 1981, they started to get updated things sent to the factory between 82 and 85 where they would refurbish them to MLD standard. So an updated ML and MLD wouldn't have all the features, for example, full new production MLD which were sold to foreign customers would have little streaks or little vortexes on the pitot tube they would also have a new dog tooth edge to the wing but especially the earlier conversions would not and just some other things it gets convoluted it's a thing for another day but Afghanistan war important used a lot it made sense there and that's good because foreign customers were not really flocking to this design. It wasn't really replacing the MiG-21 like they, like they had hoped. Frankly, the 23MF, especially the 23MS, the juice just wasn't worth the squeeze. It wasn't enough of an improvement over the 21 to justify the cost all around and more complexity. Plus, even into the 80s, the MiG-23 had a higher reported accident malfunction rate you know, accidental casualty rate compared to the 21. Even if it did have a much more advanced radar and beyond visual range missiles. So, a lot of foreign customers weren't that interested. Now, the ML and MLD, especially the D, really did show the potential of the design. And that was good. But, by that point, the fourth generation was starting to come online and most just kind of skipped over it. That means that most 23s served in Russia with either the VVS or the PVO, who actually seemed to really prefer it. So they were kind of the most uh, standard operator in the 80s. 
they would get their own version that was lightened the 23 ma it had a lightened and improved radar it also started using the r24 improved version of the r23 missile since the r27 was still taking time yeah so that would also be carried over to the mld for the vvs so we do see a few more improvements we actually start to see the very first like laser guided bombs thanks to the uh IR sensor and everything integrated, you know, changes to the Afghan war. So we do see these used as ground attackers a bit. Um, Iraq also used some in the 1980s against Iran. There was even a dedicated version starting off as the MiG-23B. They would be produced for Russia. The BK would be produced for Warsaw Pact and the BN for other export customers. And basically... It was just a little bit stronger strengthened version, more powerful engine, except for the BN, but also more simplified for ground attacking. This would ultimately result in the MiG-27 appearing in the mid-70s, which was a dedicated ground attack, close air support variant. And I wish Hobbymaster would give us one. It's kind of the missing MiG, but it is a 23 variant. So maybe one day we'll get it. I don't know how much they'd have to modify the tooling. Regardless, Iraq used the 23MF and the 23BN during the invasion of Kuwait in 1990. Pretty good effect there, but in 1991, they did not do well against the F-15, F-18, uh, between uh, 6 and 10 or shot down in January of 1991 alone. And most other nations uh, would uh, kind of start turning them out of service. There would be over 1,500 different variants in Russia and during the disillusionment of the USSR, and they would keep them in service for a bit. This one here is a ML, like I said. I put uh, the R-73 missile on it, which these could use, and I just knocked it off. <laughs> and well, I think I need to glue this one again. The glue's getting a little chippy. But... Um, some late versions could use that, especially the 2398 proposal. This one is from uh, the Czech Air Force, I believe, in the 90s. But most uh, European nations would retire these sometime between 96 and 2000. In Russia, the VVS would finally downgrade their fleet in the 90s as part of uh, cost reduction. Uh, the VVS would get rid of theirs in 97, and the PVO would retire their last ones in 98. It was just, you know, economic downturn. They only produced about 5,000 total, a little more. So not nearly as successful as the MiG-21. But that said, it is still the most mass-produced variable geometry wing, sweep wing military aircraft in history. So everything's relative, right? And it wasn't a total failure. It was an interim solution until the fourth generation was finally available, which we're going to talk about now. The fourth generation of jet fighters, really they begin in the late 70s and really run in a lot of cases to today. While some interceptors are involved, this is really the rise of the air superiority fighter, followed by need for multi-role fighters, so we see a transformation. We also see a rise in digital computers, smaller computers becoming a thing, new avionics, better uh, fly-by-wire controls, better displays, things of that nature. In the U.S., you know, you have the F-14, F-15, then a short time later the F-16, F-A-18, all Generation 4. And in Russia, we have two main ones the Suhoi Su-27, which we won't talk about today because this video is plenty long enough, and of course our MiG for the day, the MiG-29 and its variants. And because it's my video, I'm including this in Generation 4 as well. MiGs-31, we looked at the Fox Bat, this is the Fox Hound, again, one we recently featured. But since these did not enter into serial production until 1979, and since they're very much being flown still today by the VKS, it's, it's in there. It's kind of crossing that gap between Generation 3 and Generation 4, but since it's a current, 
Air Force plane, I think it counts. So let's kind of go back and recount this. And then we'll do the fulcrum. At the time I'm recording this video, this is the newest line from Hobby Master. And there's only two out, the initial 31K and the 31B, which I just did a full video on. And actually what kind of inspired me to get all the MIGs out and have fun with MIGs. If this looks like the 25 Fox Bet, that's because it really is a derivative of it. But it's its own thing. As we talked about in the Fox Bet video, it had some good things going for it. A good uh, climb, time to altitude, good top speed, good altitude. If overall, the R-40 missiles were quite good for their day and time. But it had shortcomings. It was still subsonic at low altitude. It couldn't maneuver for crap down there, even up high. Its maneuverability was limited range was limited so they wanted to address those issues in 1975 they had a, a more of a concept a proof of concept they took a 25 essentially and made it longer given a second seat it flew they would work on the design there would be some low rate production between 76 and 79 but it did not enter into production till 79 and it actually did not enter into service until 1981 primarily for the PVO because they were it was meant to kind of help protect the northern expanses of Russia from attacks coming over the poles see Admiral Byrd was right sort of and uh, it was mainly meant to shoot down cruise missiles which is what makes the 31k variant so ironic launched from aircraft like the new B1B or older B52s and of course from submarines and, and other things and of course to attack those it could also do a secondary role as a bomber escort and just general airspace uh, secure -er -er. it has uprated engines and of course like i said it has two seats we have a pilot in the front a weapons and radar officer in the back we have a much improved radar system from the original and that works in combination with the new R-33 missile or although some of the very first ones still might have had the R-40 because the 33 wasn't ready for a couple of years so we have four semi-recessed points under the fuselage and we have four wing hard points for air-to-air -air missiles uh, originally it could have had the R-60 but this is soon replaced by the updated R-73 uh, and a more improved longer range version and uh, depending on the exact variant it could actually carry up to 20,000 pounds under its belly and it could even carry two external fuel tanks for a total of six points although it's just that we're giving it a much better range and it was capable of aerial refueling at least later versions performance at altitude was about the same about Mach 2.8, a little more, but it was more maneuverable. But where, where it really exceeded the Fox Bat was low altitude. It was supersonic, about Mach 1.2, and it was much better maneuverability. Still wasn't going to be mistaken for a dogfighter, but it was better. We also had a higher max altitude, even with more of a payload, up to 82,000 feet, give or take. And we had better communications, not just with the ground, but other aircraft. In fact, four of these could really control a large amount of airspace, communicating with each other, sharing targets, sharing data. And in addition, they could actually link up to other aircraft, like the SU-27 and the later MiG-29 and so on and so forth, to help direct and control them, making it pretty damn effective, all things considered. The radar started off able to track 10 targets, and actively go at four later versions would expand this to 24 targets go at six and even some say eight so yeah well like i said this is the mig 31b it's kind of the second generation if we're you know kind of think like that 
The first batch, just the MiG-31, was really produced from 1979 through 1988, and it was the vast majority of, of production. And it would enter into the PVO, although other branches would have it in limited numbers, especially uh, the Ruf Russian naval aviation, and it was only used by Russia during the communist era. There would be a transitional kind of specialist run known as the 31DZ and its variants made in 89, 90, and 91. They'd make a hundred of them, but it was really a developmental step to this version here, the 31B, made between 90 and 94. So it's one of the few planes that continued on in uh, production after the end of communism. And they would build 69 of the Bs. But because of the disillusionment of the USSR, 50 of those would go to Kazakhstan who actually still flies about 20 or 25 today. It's really the only foreign user of the Fox Sound. To make up for this, what Russia did, they took some of the older aircraft, be the original 31s or 31DZs, and updated them to the 31B standard, designated them as the 31BS, kind of like before we had the MiG-25 PDS. And um, yeah, quite a few advancements forward here for this new version. We made an aerial refueling probe a standard feature, which extended its range in addition to the tanks. It actually had quite a good range for its uh, overall consumption of fuel, about 2,000 miles. We also had a new radar, partially because the original specs were leaked to the west. That always seems to happen. And this was combined with an upgraded version of the R-33 missile. And we simply had new avionics and just, you know, overall a more polished design. But it was still pretty much a dedicated interceptor at this point with the, the B. And not much happens in the 90s. Part of it was the recession in Russia. Part of it was the powers that be were really focusing more and more on Suhoi. MiG had its day, 50s, 60s, 70s. But with the end of the Soviet Union... Suhoi is really kind of coming in, but the Foxhound is such a good aircraft overall in its, in its intended role that they didn't get rid of it, even though production was over. And in fact, as the economy rebounded in 2008, a program was established to modernize and update it and really transform it into a multi-role fighter aircraft interceptor and even attack aircraft. This would, of course, be the MiG-31BM for the Bs updated, and would be the MiG-31BSM for those updated. And uh, that will be the next release from Hobby Master, and I'm actually quite excited when it comes out, but it will probably not be until next year. Either way, the idea was it had a new data link system, more secure, had a new digital computer system, new avionics, had a new cockpit with LCD displays, it had HOTUS controls, um, and it of course had access to newer ordnance. It would use the R-33E missile for a while, but eventually the new R-37M would come into use along with the new radar setup. This gave it much better range and uh, tracking ability and it would eventually start to switch out well it it really still uses the r72 some sources claim that it's starting to be fitted with the r77 i don't know that seems to be more propaganda the use of the r77 in the vks is uncertain but either way we do have that oh and i forgot to mention this does have a cannon unlike the uh, fox bat it's a 23 millimeter cannon with 260 rounds although some later versions would delete it for purposes where it wasn't really called for like the 31k but yeah lots of improvements to to make it a modern aircraft in addition to those warden you know air to air it could carry air to surface guided munitions for example the uh, the kh the KH-31s, even the KH-58s, so on and so forth. So you've got 
and like bunker buster type missiles you've got anti-radiation missiles you've got anti-ship missiles yeah and it can carry a good number like I said up to 20,000 pounds under the wings so it can carry quite a bit and the 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 uh, KH-47 M2 cruise missile of the K variant is pretty impressive it has a range of 1200 miles it's capable of Mach 10 but the trade-off there is it becomes a true attack aircraft because that's the only weapon it has so it has no way to really defend itself except the fact that it's really fucking fast even by modern standards there were talks about starting up production again but it was decided no let's just refurbish the existing airframes quite a few have been put into storage in the 90s because of budget cuts and then they were brought back into service like i said kazakhstan would get about 50 and the total production was 519 meaning that roughly 470 including prototypes were in russia some were you know lost worn out but they had the bulk between 2010 and 2020 contracts were signed to update about 100 to 110 to the new standard not just for the vks but also the russian naval aviation services and then more recently a decision was made to extend the service life until at least 2030 so as of this year the uh, russian military is still re sending planes back and getting them refurbished and you know updated and new computers and things continue to be integrated as that happens so we'll probably see that you know going on for quite a while it seems like around 130 are in service most of them are of the bm or bsm standard but there are some older b's left especially with the navy neat plane and i'm really glad hobby master finally did this one now if we'll hurry up and get us some of the other cool variants i should also point out that these have been used to pretty devastating effect in ukraine some were stationed in Crimea, others would fly from bases in Russia. Again, pretty good range, especially with aerial refueling. The R-33, well, you could, Ukraine could kind of go up against it, but the R-37, with its range, it, there's really nothing they have that can combat it. So their only hope against the Foxhound is to you know, get them on the ground before they launch. And then the, uh, the the KH-47 M2, several of those have been launched against Ukraine, including Kiev. And while many get shot down by missile batteries and whatnot, more than a few get through. And it can be quite powerful. So we'll see where the future goes for this. But since it was only in Russian service, that's pretty much the service history. And I guess technically it's the lowest rate production aircraft we're looking at in this video. But in some ways, it served longer than most others. And now, it's time to talk about our next fourth generation fighter. The MiG-29. For years, I wanted Hobby Master to do a MiG-29. And when it finally came out, I was not disappointed. They did a really good job. We've had it in 172 scale die cast before but it was based on the old witty wings tooling even if some like uh, jg updated it uh, i don't know there's something about the hobby masters that just feel more solid and they end up doing quite a few interesting variants first on the spinny thing we have a mig 29a or rather 29b uh fulcrum a from East Germany, Germany. Essentially the first production version here of the light tactical fighter, which was kind of a two-pronged approach for the fourth generation. It's interesting how the two sides played off each other. Russia created the MiG-25 in response to the B-58 and the B-70 bombers, but America was pretty concerned about it before they really got their hands on it in 76. That plus lessons from Vietnam would inspire the FX, the Advanced 
fighter, the experimental fighter program. And that would have interesting results in the 1970s. Likewise, Russia would create the MiG-23 in response to new generation American fighters in the 60s, like the F-4 Phantom. And that FX program would, would result in the F-15 and in a roundabout way, the F-16, the F-18, and, you know, that whole generation. And it, it, it's even related to the F-14. But Russia, of course, had to respond. And thus, in 1969, they put out some very strenuous, very demanding demands. The new fighter needed to be Mach 2 plus capable carry a lot of different we you know different range of weapons a number of weapons a heavy payload of weapons it needed to have long range good endurance it needed to have good maneuverability it needed to be agile and it needed to be able to take off land so operate from short airfields or like front lined basically shitty airfields you know uh, gravel pits uh, if it sounds like that's kind of impossible for one aircraft to do especially with the technology of the 1960s 70s you would be right and the uh, the leader of the mig design bureau petition in 1970 look that this won't work we need to we need to break this new fighter up and in 1971 the powers that be relented this is where we end up with the heavy long range if we want to call it strategic fighter and the light tactical fighter and Suhoi would end up with the heavy version. This would end up being the SU-27. And MiG would be officially given the go-ahead in 1974 for the light version, which would, of course, become the MiG-29 here. And the first prototype would fly in the autumn of 1977 and would undergo a pretty extensive test and evaluation period with several prototypes and pre-production models lasting through 1982. And it was accepted for VVS service in 81. Of course, the Afghanistan war is going on, so there's a bit of a need. And it would start to be delivered production models in the summer of 1983. And that would be the original Fulcrum A. The, the A was technically the version for the Soviet Union, and the B was the slightly downgraded version for Warsaw Pact nations. Mostly, it was just that it did, couldn't carry nuclear weapons. Had a few other limitations, but that that's the big one, which you know, makes sense. And these would be quickly ramped up for mass production. And I, there's something about the lines of the MiG-29 that I really like. Kind of reminds me of the F-A-18 and the lines. So, let's talk about the features. After all, this was meant to replace the MiG-21, since the MiG-23 really wasn't living up, although, yeah, the interim ML, MLDs are doing better, so replace the 21 finally, and replace the 23. This is why production was ending in 84. Could it do it? And were they right to have a two-fighter program? This is a relatively small, lightweight fighter. 57 feet by 37 feet. We're back to fixed wings. We have two R33 turbofan after burning engines. It is capable of Mach 1.2 at low altitude and about Mach 2.2 at high altitude. It has a ceiling of a little under 60,000 feet, 59 to 69,000 feet, just kind of depending on the version. So a little less than some before, but it's sufficient. The cockpit is actually greatly inspired by the MiG-23, especially on the initial A model. And the radar is actually an evolution and development of the one being used in the 23 as well. And at this point, the aircraft, this is an air superiority fighter. Generation 4 was back to fighters being important. Again, Vietnam War. And so this is, yeah, look at the F-15. 
the F-14, just that, that need for speed thing. It was the 80s. So, yeah. <laughs> when they designed it, they had considered a limited ground attack ability, although it was not much realized in the initial version here. But it soon would be. It also didn't have a lot of fuel. <laughs> it um, had seven hard points total, so more than the 23. Three under each wing, and these were for air-to-air -air missiles. Essentially, the inboard pylon was for the heavier one. In the middle, it could be either or, but the far outer ones really could only carry the lighter missiles. The center line was most often taken up by a fuel tank, which was kind of needed because on internal fuel alone, this thing had a range of less than 900 miles. I mean, we have two engines, so what do you expect? And it's lightweight. And the initial version only could mount that one center line drop tank. And initially, it would use the same R-60 missile as on this one here. Four of them was a common loadout with two of the very new at the time R-27 missiles. Remember that was what they were hoping to equip the later MiG-23s with but it just wasn't ready so they went with the, the R-24 variant. Finally this has the R-27 for more of a beyond visual range missile and then we have R-60s initially for close in. So six. And we do have a cannon. And we're going back to 30 millimeter, and we have 150 rounds, so not too bad. But one problem, you can't use it if you have a center line fuel tank. It um, it blocked the ejection port for the shells from the cannon, so that's not good. So you had to kind of make a decision. That was a bit of a design uh, yeah, shortcoming. <laughs> now, trade-off for the relatively light fuel and everything was this could operate from austere airway airfields uh, runways at least reasonably so so there is that and it was quite simple and dependable mechanically less complicated than the MiG-23 it did have computer integration at this point although the cockpit's still pretty pretty analog it, the cockpit has good visibility but because of the design the pilot I had to kind of focus down on his instruments a lot, which kind of limited his situational awareness. That was an issue observed quite early on. And uh, the earlier versions did not have an aerial refueling probe either, so that would limit their range. So basically these were point defense fighters. Germany here would quickly determine that they, they weren't really good for, for air patrol. They were, they were good to station, you know, get them up in there quick. They were fast. They were very agile, something the West would rec would recognize very quickly. And the West would not have to wait very long to get up close and personal with the new jet. In 1986, Russia would show these off in Finland. And in 1988, they would actually show them off in England, which was pretty historic. This is the first time... Russia had brought aircrafts to an international air show, especially their, their newest thing, since like before World War II. Usually before when the West saw things, it was like during the May Day to Parade or something similar. Interesting. So they were showing, and, and the West really respected it. I mean, um, it was considered to be more maneuverable, kind of a quicker thing than, say, the uh, F-16. Now, they recognized it had less fuel, it had limitations, but for a little handy fighter it was recognized and of course that gets into the whole name the nato reporting name of fulcrum it kind of shows that respect like i said a while back in the video you can tell how much nato seemed to think of the aircraft based on the name they gave it and not only did the russians not take the name fulcrum as an insult they liked it in fact this sometimes was unofficially kind of nicknamed the fulcrum within russia so even though Russia wasn't really into naming its planes, it just designated them. If this had a name, it would probably be Fulcrum. That's uh, kind of a fitting deal. So yeah, production would be well underway in the 1980s. 
East Germany would get about 24 mostly single seats A models or at least uh, the B the export version but it would also get four two seat UB trainers and it would actually continue to fly these past reunification into the 1990s other nations would have them as well but probably the most one of note is Poland they would acquire some from Russia in the late 80s themselves they would get more from the Czechs in the mid 90s and then when Germany was ready to get rid of theirs post Kosovo war they never used them in Kosovo in the night in 1999 but around 2000 they were ready to kind of get them out of the Luftwaffe so they would actually sell them to Poland for one euro each it's a hell of a deal one end on that a poem would get 22 I think one had been lost in a crash and one was kept for the uh, aviation museum in Germany so Poland was acquiring a good number in fact they would end up being the largest user of the MiG-29 within NATO in the 21st century and they would start a pretty major update modernization plan for about 30 of their planes around 2011 and had very good luck with them even integrating NATO standard weapons until about 2017 then they would start to have air crashes they would lose three planes due to crashes due to malfunctions in 2018 2019 and that was just showing that, that the airframes were aging and there's only so much you can do to modernize them plus you know late Soviet manufacturing wasn't always the best but several nations would get these unlike the uh, the Foxhound which only served to two nations over 30 nations would fly the MiG-29 including India who we've started to see is a pretty big fan of uh, MiG's products but let's get the base model off the stand and talk about not the second generation but let's say generation 1.5 the first revision throughout this video we've seen that Really the first production run of most MiGs or really any Soviet aircraft have some major bugs. The MiG-23 being one of the biggest examples. So the fact that over 600 Fulcrum A types plus nearly 200 B types were built is a pretty good testament that they got it pretty right from the beginning. But there were still shortcomings, some major ones. The cannon thing was pretty goofy. Uh, people in the VVS wanted an upgraded version, and they eventually would get it in the 80s in the form of the MiG 29S, known in NATO as the Fulcrum C. And that's what we have here. A lot of the changes are internal. One that you can see is the weapons loadout. This version was built with a new radar because the previous one had been compromised. Uh, we had a traitor, Rudolph. And so a new radar was introduced and to work with an upgraded version of the uh, R27, I believe it was the R27E. And we also start to use the R73, replacing the R60. We also fixed the cannon issue. You can now have a center line tank and the 30 mil cannon can be used. Although to make this work, they had to scale it back to 100 rounds, but 100 rounds you can actually shoot is still better than 150 you cannot. And we actually plumb the inner hard points, inner pylons for two additional drop tanks. So in theory, the 29S can carry three external tanks, although often it still just had the center line tank when it was in the fighter role. And they started to activate some of its limited ground attack capabilities. They strengthened the wings, the airframe, so it could carry up to 8,800 pounds in ordnance. Previous versions couldn't quite carry as much, and uh, it could carry iron bombs rocket pods, you know, the usual. To work with this, it had upgraded R33K engines. And 
to better improve things for the pilot and handling. The hydraulics were overhauled. The cockpit was slightly reworked. By the way, the MiG-29, as we've seen throughout this video too, continued to have a very excellent ejection seat system. Um, like I said, the 23 introduced a 00 seat. The 29 would continue that. And something you might not always think about Russians having good ejection seats, but there you go. It also would get new computers installed and just other avionic updates in addition to the radar system. Yeah, just improving things. And probably the literally biggest thing is the hump on the back. This was called the fat back nickname because you have this fairing in the back. One of the very first changes done even with the A was based on experiences in Afghanistan. They added chaff and flare. We saw those added to the uh, MiG-23. They would do that here. They would also add electronic countermeasures, ECM equipment in that hump, and they would add a little bit of extra fuel tankage. Not a, not a huge amount, but every bit helps. And they didn't want to go full bore like they had done back with the MiG-21 uh, SMT MTs where it was just way too much. So they were more conservative on that hump, not wanting to destroy the uh, agility and the handling overall. So, yeah. But it, it helped. It really did. The MiG-29S wasn't everything the VVS wanted, but... It was a good chunk of it. They knew there was still room for improvement, but they got it. And there would be an export model known as the MiG-29C. It had a somewhat downgraded radar system. But on the other hand, it was designed to work with a wider range of weapons because Russia wasn't just thinking Warsaw Pact. They were thinking, well, like I said, India, the Middle East, whoever. So it needs to work with French, British, American weapons. And uh, it also had further expansion of its ground attack capabilities. The inner hardpoint really could carry a decent amount of ordnance. They could actually carry up to six 660 kilogram bombs although if they did that the range would be pretty limited and you would have pretty limited fuel but you know it's possible it could be done and this is one of the bigger bombs we've seen on a mig too of this type and that's kind of where things stood as we get into the uh, late 80s iraq would actually get some in preparation for their invasion of Kuwait and they would get pissy because they were hoping for the new fancy R-73 missile and Russia shorted them and gave them the R-60s so Saddam Hussein and Nahuf refused to order more MiG-29s. India though was uh, actually ended up being a pretty big purchaser of these and uh, would continue to fly them into the 21st century and updating their fleet of nearly 70, which actually kind of gets us to our next upgrade step. I should say what when the Soviet Union ended 1991, they had built about 530 of the Fulcrum C-type, be it the, the S or the C model, you know, in this kind of generation 1.5. But unfortunately for MiG and the MiG-29, like I said, the powers that be preferred Sukhoi in the 1990s. It was seen as a better investment. It didn't cost a whole lot more money. It was more flexible, longer range, better endurance. It had more multi-role potential because that was the name of the game post-Cold War. And it was seen early on. Even though MiG had tried pushing the MiG-29M, a modernized version, in several different configurations for years, it really didn't go anywhere. It wasn't until the economy started to recover. Around 2005, finally, the Russian Air Force decided they could afford to update their fleet, refurbish their fleet, maybe even buy some newer models. And that was good, because the ones they had were kind of wearing out and wearing out quick. Some of them were already built kind of shoddily, and even if they were built correctly, 
they really weren't maintained well in the late 90s, early 2000s. Something about when you don't pay your people, yeah, the, the care goes way down. There are some horror stories about the Russian Navy, especially the submarine fleet in the late 90s. I had a teacher that went over there and saw some of that, and it was uh, it was horrifying. It's amazing that Kursk was the biggest disaster, frankly. Anyway, though, yeah, this is the 29S. This is a Russian flown version. It's a little bit different. Hobby Master, the hump is a little bit bigger. It's probably hard to see on camera. The antenna are a little different. That's why I gave it a little bit of a different weapons loadout with the R73s and put the R60s on the older one. But now, our third and finer fulcrum. The MiG-29 SMT. This was actually the first Hobby Master I picked up. The first one they released. And it's quite an interesting variant. S is taken from the MiG-29S we just talked about, basically radar. M is actually for multi-role, and T is for tankage. Well, I'm sort of I'm being very loose there. And this was a really a big, big time in coming, frankly. In 2005, the Russian Air Force gave the go-ahead to modernize the MiG-29 fleet to make them into a multi-role close air support ground attack aircraft. They had been doing so with the SU-27 and as we've already talked about the MiG-31 would soon be cleared for updates as well. So they thought to use the same technology, some of the same weapons. One problem, there wasn't really funding. The SU-27 and the MiG-31 kind of took up the budget, but something had to be done. In fact, the MiG-29 fleet was grounded in 2008 because of poor condition, poor maintenance, several accidents. The next year, 100 were, again, cleared for flying, but it's clear that uh, this wasn't going to last very long. So something had to be done. And they even talked about retiring the MiG-29 in 2013, really just leaning on the SU-27, and its variants and maybe going to a new plane but they kind of walk this back somewhat as for MIG just because Sukhoi was kind of the golden child the favored son in the 90s doesn't mean they gave up on updating modernizing and marketing the fulcrum here the first attempt at a multi-roller ground attack version was the MiG-29SM, basically taking the S and giving it the ability to launch air-to-surface guided weapons, initially laser and TV guided, kind of based on the technology we saw with the MiG-23 in from Afghanistan. Later, they would also add anti-shipping to its uh, repertoire. And this would be taken ahead, and then in 1998, the essentially full-featured prototype of what would become the SMT would fly that summer. And really the first major interest came from India. They wanted to modernize their fleet to the new standard, and so talks began. And they ended up having some done in Russia, some were done domestically. Other nations considered buying it, but it would back out or only get limited numbers. It's a whole thing. But we can't talk about what they've done because it is a pretty pretty major reworking of our plane. For one, we have new RD-43 engines, more thrust, more power. We have a stronger frame for carrying more payload. We can carry almost 10,000 pounds now. We still have seven underwing hardpoints. The center line and inner two here are plumbed, as you can see, for drop tanks. And now we have an aerial refueling probe, a standard. It's a bolt-on probe. It's not retractable, but it's there. We also have more internal fuel. You see the humpback has continued to get bigger with, with more fuel tankage and avionics, electronics. This has 150% the internal fuel compared to the initial Fulcrum A. 
and when you account for the ability to refuel in the air, it could have a range of about 3,000 miles. And it didn't compromise on speed. It could still do Mach 2.2 at altitude or 1.2 at sea level. It was still quite agile. But the new computer systems installed, and eventually you'd get a new cockpit with new displays, liquid crystal, other things. All new things to let it well, be a, a true multi-role fighter. It still could use the uh, R-27E missile. It used the R-73. And it was designed to use even newer ones like the R-77. Although, in reality, those have been in pretty limited use within the VKS. But that's no mind. We still have a cannon, 100 rounds, 30 millimeter. Not really getting rid of that. But just really a lot of updates to the avionics, going to more digital, more secure communication systems, trying to make things better for the, for the pilot. And then, of course, yeah, our ground ordnance here. It could launch the KAB-500 guided bombs. It's kind of an earlier thing. But it could also carry up to four KH-25 air-to-surface missiles, relatively medium size, or two KH-29. I think of them as bunker buster missiles. Maybe I'm wrong, but they're kind of an anti-structure missile. Even cooler to me, it can carry two KH-31P anti-radiation, so anti-radar, basically for uh, wild weasel type missions, or two KH-31A anti-shipping missiles. Pretty neat. Now the outer points are really only going to carry the lightweight air-to-air -air missile so it's going to be the R-73 for the most part. And usually the inner will have the fuel tanks. So we really only have two spots for air-to-surface ordnance. But realistically for a lightweight fighter, that, that's okay. That, that's still more than enough, all things given. We also start to see targeting pods and other types of jamming pods is an optional feature. Some of these are new construction, many are going to be rebuilt. About 1,600 MiG-29s have been built to this point. Of those, 1,350, give or take, were built during the Soviet era. So only a couple hundred have been built since then, but they've refurbished and updated a, a great number. Like I said, India would do well over 60. And so what about the the Russians? They, they've, they've actually made a pretty good update to the MiG, but can they find the money to get some? Well, around 2009 or so, MiG had a canceled contract of 28 SMTs. These would end up being transferred at a good deal to the Russian Air Force, and would essentially be the first ones in service. And like I said, they floated the idea of just, you know, moving on in 2013, but instead in 2014, they placed a purchase order for another regiment's worth, some say 14, some say 16, either way, more. And these would be delivered over the next few years. So not many have really gone into uh, VKS service, but still, you're, you're looking at uh, you know 40 or 50 total. They actually did have the funding before all this to update a whopping three 29Ss before. So, that happened. These would see combat along updated versions of the SU-27. They would be sent to Syria in 2016. This would be the first time the SMT would see combat. They would be used as an escort fighter. They would also be used to attack ground targets. Because again, they can carry a decent payload. I mean, nearly 10,000 pounds, the, the MiG-31 we looked at, 20,000. So considering how much smaller this is and lighter, not bad. Even if they have two weapons, they can be relatively big ones. So they were used in both roles and um, seemed to work pretty well for them. But 
these are still aging airplanes and the the quality is kind of all over the place and it's hard to really know what's true you know one says says one thing one says says another they have been flying since then in various conflicts here and there of course ukraine themselves had plenty of mig 29s and update they have their own update program called the mewtwo not to be confused with the pokemon but um Oh, that would be hilarious. I just thought, what if someone combined Jet Fighters, like War Thunder, with Pokemon? That would be funny. The only thing I know about Pokemon is my little cousin was into it. But anyway, they're still in service today. Limited numbers. One I wish Hobby Master would make is the MiG 29K, because it was a long time in coming. This was a navalized version, first proposed way back in the 80s. Eventually, 28 would be purchased by the Russian Navy for their carrier, serving around with the Su-33. And uh, I believe India also picked up some of those as well, but I could be mistaken. So a few of the K models finally did go into service. There's been other proposals and other things, but didn't really much go of anywhere. Of course, there's also the MiG-35 proposal, but who knows if that'll really go much beyond the pre-production phase. So, what next? Well, I've been banging on about it, so let's go into the issue 27 and all of its variants. Okay, now, this video is long enough. But... I did actually have to get these down too, and I had to get the MiGs down, so maybe I'll do a second video on Sukhois. We'll see. By the way, do you have the R-77 on this one? This is, of course, the large fighter. Very interesting between all of these. Well, as I promised way back at the very beginning, let me line them all up. I'm going to share with you kind of my thoughts on each of the MiGs, which one's kind of my favorite MiG design, and also which model variant from hobby master is my favorite you know like of the 29s and all that stuff and then we'll end this here mig video Alrighty, took a minute there ate a bite relaxed and now let's kind of wrap it up thoughts feelings and again if you could please do like share subscribe uh, this was a lot more work than I thought it would be, but I don't regret it. And I do have a Patreon. Anyone who knows the Misha Co. knows that. So uh, if you want to go over and pitch a buck, wouldn't hurt. If not, that's fine too. I do these for fun. And to hopefully share something I enjoy with other people. Anyway, we have, yeah, a half century of MiGs. And these are the ones I picked as kind of my favorites of the Hobby Masters that I do have and I'll explain why beginning with the 15 it's a lot easier when they're on the spinny thing and I know everything's at I picked this one I just um, I think the Tanks are interesting on it. There's not a lot of difference in the 15, so, you know, pick one or anything. I do like that we have a few different styles and types. That's pretty neat. But yeah, having a reconnaissance version, e there's just not much variation in the 15s, frankly. Even if it was, I suppose, the most produced version here. Moving to the 17, it had to be the North Vietnamese one. And it's actually one I've never shown you before. And maybe it's a little goofy that I put missiles with it, but hey, my, my plane, and they're just plugged into the wings. But I really wish they would do the PM version someday. I just really like them. Obviously, for the MiG-19, no choices. I don't believe Panzerkampf has done other variants I think they've just done a few different paint schemes but I do like how the model had uses magnets to attach things while it's maybe not as nice as a hobby master as I was saying maybe it's not as nice as a hobby master 
when I ordered it, it came in a lot nicer than I expected because I'd handled the Panzer, French, Mirage, and Raphael. And uh, while they're acceptable, yeah, this one actually has a good feel to it. Moving on to the 21s, maybe I cheated, but since there's just a lot of difference in these two molds, I think it's okay to pick one for the P, F, M, and then another. I, I only have a couple of these, so I just went with this one because I do like the gun pack. I don't really like the look of this plane, just slim and trim, that delta wing. This was how the MiG-21 started off, just a little zoomy aircraft. And you might have expected me to pick the biz version, but there's something about the fat back, the big spine, that I really enjoy. Even if it was a transitional step, it wasn't all that great. I just, I just, I don't know. I like it. And I like this one in its kind of armed up configuration with a total of four missiles. And it's Russian, so that's neat. As for the 25, it had to be the original 25P, especially Lieutenant Polanco's. Just such a historic aircraft, and I, I don't know, I just kind of like it. And it's the first one Hobby Master did, and they did such a bang up job on this model. You know, you would expect them to do all of these. Especially the, well, maybe, you know, the 17s, maybe it's so close to the 15. But you were expecting them to do a 15, a 21, and even a 25. But doing a 23, I can't think off the top of my head any other diecast maker that's done a 23. And the fact that they actually do multiple versions. They, they have an M, an MS, MF, ML, MLD. And I picked this one, of course, because for one thing, I do like the ML slash MLD more than the MF look. But really, it's just because it's the Afghan war scheme. And I do like the uh, dispenser spines here. I think they just kind of give it a neat look. As for the 31... With only two to choose from right now, I really like, I think the K is neat, but the B is, is just clearly more interesting, more ordnance going on, more of the traditional role, and more historically important. And for the 29, now I realized I might have grabbed the wrong 29. I have a couple of these that are very similar to the touch. Either way, I would pick one in the kind of pure air-to-air -air configuration. I really do like the SMT, and I almost picked it, but, you know, I grew up with the MiG-29 as kind of the, the enemy jet of note. And this was an air superiority fighter years before it ever thought about being a multi-role fighter. So when I think of it, yeah, being armed with six missiles it's just the way to go but they're all neat and i'm glad they have given us the original version the s slash c version and the smt although there's only a couple of smts so far now if they would only give us a k or maybe one of the indian export updated versions that'd be neat too so, well, I like all my hobby masters. You know, just kind of going off the top of my head. These are maybe my favorites. At least they are tonight right now as we're doing it. So, what else to say? I think one day it'd be fun to do a video comparing these really in depth with their western counterparts. But obviously the MiG-15 goes up against the F-86. Although, it would be also fair to compare it to the F-84. The MiG-17... There's not an exact equivalent in America, but since it did serve in Vietnam too, yeah, there, there's not something, you might say something like the F5, but even that's not really right. 
it it just kind of gets folded in like the 15 because they're they are so very similar the mig 19 obviously is equivalent to an f100 super saber other first generation supersonic jets the mig 21 is the mig 21 it's hard to really even think about comparisons it's its own thing you might think of it somewhat similar to some of the early mirages from France this might be closer to like the F5 in America kind of lightweight small dependable but of course it too went up it, it definitely punched above its, uh, its weight class it really took it on and really really kind of jumped that gap between second and third generation fighters I'm gonna be honest looking at the generations they make more sense from a Western perspective. When you start putting them really with the Comblock aircraft, they still hold true, but you can kind of tell the systems were made with a more of a Western mindset because the Western aircraft line up more than these. As for the 25, yeah, it's its own thing as well. In some ways, I'm thinking of like the F-102, the F-106. Those were America's more or less dedicated interceptors of around the same period. You might think the F-105 too, and in some ways they're similar, but that was designed for more low altitude striking. This was high and, you know, difference there. That's more ground. This is air. But it is kind of of that generation of just brute power before maybe technology had really surpassed it. Just, you know, powerful engines that guzzled the fuel. <laughs> and the 23 is interesting as well. It certainly went up against the F-4 Phantom. Even, you could say the F-16 from Afghanistan and it definitely shows inspiration from the F-111 and of course similarities with the F-14 even though you know they came out around the same time but it's a much smaller lighter aircraft compared to the F-14 much cheaper too and it's kind of going with a different you know tactic it, 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 it's it's somewhat the overlooked MIG, but on the other way, it, to me, it, it's so closely identified with the Afghan war. I don't know. I, I think it's an interesting thing. I think the folding tail fin is really interesting. The manually swept wings, at least originally, later they would go to automatics. And in some ways it was a failure. In other ways it was a success. Yeah, you know, it's here or there. But... It bridges that gap, solidly third generation, getting into the 80s, and really just pushing Russian design forward. As for the MiG-31, obviously, it's kind of continuing on. Although, once it evolves into a multi-role aircraft, it's a little bit reminding me of like the F-15E, the Strike Eagle. It's 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 really interesting too how like you know the F-14 as well, which was an air-to-air -air superiority, was evolved into a multi-role with the F-14D. Not an especially great one, but decent. And you you kind of see this the interceptors in this case or air superiority fighters be, being changed for the modern battlefield. And then of course the MiG-29 as we've recently talked about. Yeah, true air superiority fighter in a lot of ways. Like a little F-15. I was going to say it's like the F-16, but no, the F-16 is is a was a multi-role medium fighter in the first place. This started off as an air-to-air -air superiority, just like the F-15, but much smaller, lighter, more nimble, and limited in a lot more ways, too. The F-15 has some awesome power behind it. But it's also evolved into a respectable little strike aircraft and what have you. 
change or die. Of these in Russia, of course, the 15 to 17 were retired in the late 50s and 60s. The 19 would make it on to the late 60s. 21 would actually continue on, at least in some versions, to the 90s. <laughs> the 23, and then interestingly, really didn't serve longer than the 21, at least not by any years that mattered. The 25 was officially retired in, in uh, 2013, although in reality it wasn't being used much before that because they had the 31. So it's really down to the 31 BM BSM and the 29 existing models and then of course the the few SMTs they still have. And technically it's still in production by MIG, although I don't really know how many new planes they're actually making because really the MIG's day in the Russian VKS and Russian Navy is, is pretty much over. Unless they just have a slam dunk coming forward, Sukhoi does seem to have the the, the lay of it with the SU-57, but really the SU-35. The 57 kind of gets all the glory, but it kind of reminds me of like our F-22 Raptor. Great plane, but in the end, other more modest, but also more just, you know, realistic aircraft take take charge. But what do you think? History really has a special place for the MiG-15. The 17 and 19 kind of fall by the wayside, even though at the time they were very important steps. But then you get to the 21. And in that case, it's usually the, the fighter versions that get precedent over the over the radar or the P, the P versions. The 25 has a little bit of a place in history, although it's falling away. The 23 has fallen away. The 31 isn't terribly well known, but the 29 still quite known. So I would say, historically speaking, the 15, the 21, and the 29 are most important, with the, obviously the MiG-21 being, yeah, the very most so. And they made a lot of them. Not quite as many as the 15, but considering... Is pretty close but that's trying to be objective subjectively what are, which ones do i like the best like in terms of look feel this kind of cool factor well i'm very happy to have a mig 19 it's it's never going to be my favorite it's it's an okay design but it's a little bit ungainly and it just didn't really have a lot going on you know a lot of history i wish we would get a mig 9 just for fun but again, those weren't produced in large numbers and really weren't historically important. The 15 is so iconic for Korea. But I have to be honest, I like the looks of the 17 more. And I honestly like how the 17 was used in so-called guerrilla air warfare in Vietnam. It took some guts to go up against F-4 Phantoms and even F-105 Thunder Chiefs in these. And of course, this one from Hobby Master in the North Korean paint scheme is pretty nifty. But the 21 is also nifty. Subjectively, I actually like the P version more. There's something about the, the stripped down, just very, well, pencil or Bella Laika look to it that I really find enjoy. Not saying I don't like the SMT and Biz versions, that they're neat, but oh, personal taste. The 25 is just an awesome looking aircraft. I remember when I was a kid and that was still pretty cool communist territory. We thought it was a threat or kind of concurrent with the F-15, but of course it wasn't. If one thing it was much older, but another thing it was just, it was never a fighter. Not even close, but all the giant ass missiles on it. The 23, before I got into the models, I'll be honest, I didn't think a whole ton about but Holly Master did a really good job with this model. The moving wings, the uh, the ordnance payload, even the folding tail fin. It has really crept in as one of my favorite little airplanes. The 31 I was so excited to get and in no ways it disappoints. Of course it looks so much like the 25 that it doesn't really matter. 
and the MiG-29 is still my, just, that's the thing. Being totally subjective is probably just when I grew up, just the lines of it. I think the 29 might be my favorite. I, love, I just love the lines of this airplane. I know it has plenty of flaws, but it's just, it's just, you know, something I like. So, oh well. Sorry, I think I'm one over. Yep. Anyway. But, what do you think? Which ones do you like the looks of? They each kind of speak to me. I like the, the rough utilitarian appearance of uh, communist aircraft in general. I just like planes. <laughs> and to, to end, as I said at the beginning, I will and did get things wrong. I'm just going off memory, just sitting here with a camera in front of a table with some models. But these are great for me because while some I had a decent idea of what they look like, being able to hold something in my hands really puts it into perspective. Reading without being able to see pictures or diagrams can only convey so much. And it's amazing sometimes the misnomers they get in our heads, if that makes sense. So, yeah. And Hobby Master's done a really good job of giving us calm block planes. I wish we saw more high quality Russian World War II propeller aircraft. Or some of the earlier Suhoi's. The 7, the 9, the 15. We just don't. But I'm not going to complain. Before Hobby Master, while well, we had some 15's and other brands. Plenty of 21's and other brands. No one was doing a 23. We had some 29s, but the quality wasn't all of the best. No one was doing a 31. Not many ever did 25s because they're just so big. It's a big, heavy model, by the way. It's the only one here that's not Hobby Master, and it's a little odd to me they didn't do one, is the 19. Just, you know, I like completing sets, and I like completing series. I also wouldn't mind if they did a MiG-15. Honestly, a Yuri Gagarin commemorative edition, because... He passed away in a crash of a MiG-15 UT, UTI trainer in 1968. But, oh well. I'd like to see uh, that, the two-seat 15. I'd like to see the missile-equipped 17 and 19. I'd love to get an early 21 F-13, the first version with missiles. Because it does look pretty different. With the 25s, I'd like to get a um, an RB, a reconnaissance bomber version, or a BM, the seed version. For the 23, we've got we've done a really good job of kind of covering everything. If I'm being honest, just because they weren't made that long. But if I'm picking an early version would be kind of neat just to show Even one of like the the V-Stall Alternatives which was technically a MiG-23, but the from the other design team that would be interesting 31 we're still getting them uh, We're getting the BM next. I don't know really what else I'd really want They're They're already covering these pretty thoroughly and the MiG 29K. The MiG 29K, I'd really like to get. So, that's the ones I'd like to see. What would you like to see? If you'd like to see what Hobby Master is making, you can go to hobbymasterarchive.com. It's, it's not a website for selling things, it's just literally an archive of all their models that they've done. So, that'll tell you what they have made in the past. Because they typically do a run. And then sell out. And they may never do it again. Like with the uh, Victor Belanco one here. But, yeah. I think one reason I focus on comm block aircraft, aside from just kind of my connection to study with Russia, there are so many people that are experts on American, like the F-86, the F-4 Phantom, the F-14, the F-16. And I, hats off to them, I salute them. And I try to know what I can know, but 
with the comm block stuff, knowledge is not quite as pervasive, prevalent, and so I enjoy researching it, digging in, and then sharing with you guys what I've learned and picked up. And again, I know I do get things wrong, so please do feel free to correct me in the comments. Sometimes it's literally just a slip of the tongue. Other times it's me legitimate being being wrong. But uh, that's all right. Hope you had a fun time today. As much work as this was, it took me three days to do it. I uh, am glad I did. And next time, yeah, since I had to get them down to get all these out anyway, we might as well cover the Sohoys, or at least the ones we have. Like I said, we don't really have the earlier ones, but companies have really done a really good job of giving us the modern 27, 30, 33, 34, 35. And uh, it's kind of important because we see them a lot in Ukraine. As, and as I said at the very beginning, this video is in no way an endorsement of the war. I made my opinion and feelings on that very clear. Keep in mind too though, Ukraine flies much the same aircraft, MiG-29s especially. So this is just a historical look. This is not a political video. At least not modern politics. Cold War politics a little bit. But mostly it's just about enjoying engineering, aviation technology, and aviation history. So again, leave your comments below. And if you could, definitely please like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'm going to bed. <laughs>